I'm not sure if we could, if you want to. I could do it. Can we, can so this is streaming that? on Facebook or only Facebook or on others as well and like uh, other YouTube platforms. as well. Yeah. yeah. Hey, but, um, everyone. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> Salam everyone. Welcome to our Global Iftar 2021 brought to you by the Ramadan Tent Project. Global Iftar is the world's largest purchased iftar. We began in London last night and we're following the sun across the globe. It's the US, Australia, India, Qatar and South Africa, Turkey and then back to London again. So thank you so much for joining us today in Doha. Um, my name is Farah and I'll be your host for this evening. We have an exciting event planned today with um, Jamal El Shayal. Um, and before we get started, I would like to thank our media partner for this year, Islam Channel, and give a special welcome to those joining us today from Islam Channel's Facebook and YouTube. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I also want to thank the Arts Council UK and their help has allowed us to continue our work this Ramadan, all of which is available on our website. Our work this Ramadan is supported by Islamic Relief, our charity partner. And you can check out the incredible work that Islamic Relief does at iruk.co slash rtp. For those joining us for the first time, our events are interactive. So I'd love you, if you can, to hop on the Zoom. And for those who are comfortable, turn your cameras on so we can see you. And um, we'll begin with a quick run through of the tech. You'll find at the bottom of your screens or in the more section of your mobile, a reactions option. So you can show us how you're feeling in real time. There's also a raise hand option as well. If you want to ask our speaker any questions or add to the discussion, we'll unmute you. And also for those who are watching us on Islam channel, you can log on, go to ramadantentproject.com and join us on the Zoom and we'll get interactive with our fantastic speaker today. Um, before we start, we'll just see how everyone's um, how everyone's going, and we've got um, Shabana, I think. Hi, Shabana. I'm not sure where you're calling from. Where are you calling from, Shabana? Hi, um, I'm from calling from London, dialed in. Um, so yeah, enjoying the nice sunny weather here. Nice, nice bit of rain. Oh, yeah, <laughs> in between the the sunshine. But yeah, how are you? How's your rooms on going? Good, Hannah. That it's. Um, I've got a little bit of time off work now, so I'm really grateful that I'm going to be taking that time just to, to ha um, in the last few days, do some contemplation, up the prayer, and have some reflection. So I'm really looking forward to that. And um, it's been. I don't know how you find it, but when you're working and maybe traveling and then juggling with Ramadan, it it, it, it can be Hamdallah full on. It's definitely a testing time, but um, yeah, the last 10 days are definitely important. And it's, yeah, it's, I feel like it's just gone too quickly though. I, I wish we were just at the beginning again, but hopefully, inshallah, it'll be another Ramzan next year. So I, I'm the same. It just, the first, this year has just gone faster than I think ever before previously we've had um you know seeing each other at the tents and interacting and seeing people in real life and lockdown was slow last year where this one's been a bit of a mix and it's just gosh only only 10 days left i know it's gone really quick but um i'm looking forward to being able to meet people in person for iftar next year so yes oh my god that will be the best in fact um going over to jamal how has it been in uh where you're based Oh, we're just gonna oh, on... sorry. in Doha. Yeah, in Qatar, it's been uh, it's been yes a second year of uh, Ramadan under lockdown. We were actually hopeful that this year wouldn't be the case because um, they dealt with COVID pretty well first time round, in the sense that you know we entered 2020 with one of the lowest death rates in the world. Um, you know, they when they did the lockdown last year, it was actually a proper lockdown, unlike some of the other countries where it was like kind of half-half. So they had, you know, shut down the airport, shut down everything. And then unfortunately, um, because they started easing the restrictions, as, as, you know, obviously it's, it was very difficult to keep those restrictions on for so long. Uh, as they eased them in the beginning of the year, the numbers kind of shut up. So unfortunately, literally the week before Ramadan, they announced another lockdown because the second wave hit a bit later than it did in other countries. So uh, so it's been, uh, you know, not, unfortunately no Tarawih. I was really hoping this year that we'd be able to go back to the mosques. That wasn't a possibility. Um, 
so there's that's one thing but uh yeah alhamdulillah you know we found ways of you know either doing these virtual events or uh you know uh there is still way there there it's not a hundred percent lockdown so you can meet of with a total of um five vaccinated people because they've been doing pretty well in terms of the vaccine so you're allowed to meet five vaccinated people so long as it's outdoors problem is with the gulf heat um it's not that easy either meeting outdoors but uh, it's all good alhamdulillah oh my gosh it sounds like quite challenging in times and um, what's the time in doha right now because then we have a van in about 45 minutes that you're in roughly yeah so it's 5 20 now so uh, we start our fast at uh, around 3.35, 3.36 a.m. And it goes on until 6 or 7, 6 or 8, something like that. So and not, um, not long to go. Yeah, yeah. Final stretch, as they say. Fantastic. And what's with Dara this evening? So we always have to know what I guess are having for Iftar. That is a very good question. Uh, I can smell it somewhere in the distance. But um, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, because I came right from work into the... I, I had work in the studios today, and then I came right home and uh, into the home office and, uh, and didn't pass by the, the production factory at the kitchen to see what they've been doing. I'm, I'm sure it smells really good, though. I have yes. to And um, what are you having... To be honest, at this part of the day, anything smells good. That's true. Well, as going to the supermarket, I mean, as, as, as you enter towards um, iftar time, every everything looks absolutely delicious. Mm. I know if I, if I go shopping just before iftar time, what do you have for Kosovo in, in the hot weather to keep you going as well? It's very different. So, yeah. yeah uh, so usually um, it would be dates, yogurt, fruits, something like that that has both kind of you know high and in terms of glucose and stuff like that that can keep you going and uh, water as well. Um, to be honest, when we say hot weather, this is the thing because, you know, it's hot if you're going to go out, but the reality is everything is, is, is air conditioned, right? So your cars are air conditioned, the offices are air conditioned and so forth. So that does ease it. If anything, I mean, the, that, that stuff is, you know, it's, it, the heat sometimes is a better thing for you to go out and then, then, uh, than the air conditioned. Thankfully, right now, the temperatures... They've gone up, they're about, it's gone up to like late 30s, early 40s. However, there isn't any um, humidity or the humidity hasn't kicked in. It's when the humidity kicks in that makes things a bit more unbearable. You feel like you're walking in a, in a sauna of some sort, but, um, but yeah. It is, it is absolutely, yeah, it, is cha- it is challenging in the heat. Um, it can be really tough. I think, Iman, you've had some um, Ramadans in, in hot weather, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I uh, I spent quite a few Ramadans in Saudi, so I can relate in terms of the weather there. But it's like Jamal mentioned, everything's air conditioned, and usually people don't go out until after iftar. Like the 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 whole schedule in Ramadan changes. The work hours or you know they accommodate that for you during Ramadan. So yeah, it's it's a completely different experience when I moved here, like spending Ramadan here. And it's like, yeah, it's just normal. You have to go to work, you know, regular hours. There's no, you know, later hours for work in Ramadan for you because you're fasting. No, you just have to, you know. So that was like kind of a uh, culture shock for me, for lack of a better word. But yeah, I mean, I do miss Ramadan back in the Middle East. It's a whole other experience. It sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, I've done some um, Ramadan a few days in the Middle East, and it is, you're right, absolutely different, very different lifestyle, very different breakfast options. Whereas here, I feel as long as I have oats or cereal, I'll be good, like say, for the whole day. You need to just just get those oats in in some way, shape, or form. Um, yeah. you, are you the same? Has your, I'm sure your support has really changed as well since you moved to the UK. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, because. Uh, um, I have some Egyptian background, so like Sahur obviously has to have the fava beans. <laughs> and, you know, like when I moved here, I'm like, okay, I, you know, I have to get up and go to work. There's no work at a later hour. So like, I found that having the, the usual Sahur food would make me a lot more um, thirsty or dehydrated. So I had to find a way to like still feel full and not feel so dehydrated when I, you know, have to commute. You know, we all know what commuting is like in London. So within the first 
couple of hours, you already feel like you, you're going to knock it out. But yeah, it, it was definitely a switch. You have to find a different food group in general to like sustain you during Ramadan. As long as it keeps going, I can see Shabana laughing. I'm sure she absolutely agrees with that. It's like, yeah, get, get in the oat, oats in some way, whether it's a milkshake or porridge or whatever. So I'm conscious of the time and we have about 40 minutes left in Belvan and I'm really eager to hear from Jamal. For those who are joining us, I'll um, tell you a little bit about um, Jamal El Shayal. He's an award-winning journalist and media personality. He's a senior correspondent for Al Jazeera English and has worked across many war zones. Jamal has a strong background in international relations and crisis management. He is a policy consultant and strategist with over a decade of experience of working with leading governmental and non-governmental organizations in Europe and the MENA regions. So um, over to you, Jamal. Thank you very much, uh, Farah, for uh, that kind introduction and uh, everyone who's joining us. Uh, it's good to participate in this uh, event for the second year. Um, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, what people have for iftar and the kind of different challenges that exist, obviously, with the, each one of them. And I think one of the interesting things Iman was saying, you know, here in the, in, the, um, in the Middle East, they do try and adapt working hours and stuff like that to make, you know, when it comes for, for, for fasting. But the reality is that, um, firstly, that's not necessarily something that's needed, right? You get the point of fasting is to challenge yourself, is to push, is to uh, feel uh, uh, maybe what uh, the, 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 how, how lucky you are uh, throughout and also to kind of renew the discipline that uh, comes with uh, uh, Islam in the sense that it's meant to help discipline your soul and your personality and so forth. Um, and it's funny because we say, you know, sometimes working hours change in the morning for the, to the evening and so forth. But in many instances, working hours just stop, right? People just stop working in the Ramadan, this part of the world, they're like, whatever, you know, they take it as an excuse to, to just not be productive. But, you know, that's the kind of, you know, hashtag first world problems. When you look at other areas in this part of the world, um, people don't have that, right? right? They don't have that luxury to be able to stop working. In fact, you know, aside from those who Ramadan for them is, 365 days a year in the sense that uh, the uh, challenges of uh, maybe just having one meal a day, if that, uh, to the uh, difficulties of, uh, you know, longer days, to the difficulties of working whilst hungry, to uh, all of these things. So I think it's always a, a good time to reflect on that and to see kind of uh, how, how fortunate we are. That's very true. And um, you you've yourself have been through many challenges as well during Ramadan. Um, how have you, you said you've worked in many situations of conflict. Would you like to share with our audience your experience of those situations and how your faith has kept you going in those um, situations? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple of times where I was uh, covering war zones where it was actually Ramadan, right? So I remember the first time I did it during a... a uh, uh, you know, there's many deployments that you'd go on during Ramadan and obviously as you'd be traveling, so you have the license to fast. I used to try and uh, as best I could not take that license purely for the simple, not for any other reason aside from I would find it difficult to remember how many days I was traveling. So it was just more straightforward and it's always easier for you to fast in a, you know, when everyone else is fasting rather than making it up a few months later where it's more difficult. And in some instances, particularly because we're reporting in English, if you're reporting in a war zone in the Middle East, uh, sometimes you're looked upon uh, because of the tension of the area as an outsider. So if you're, you know, seen drinking or eating whilst everyone else is fasting, you know, maybe people don't understand that you're traveling or and so forth. So it can either be offensive or it could make it that more difficult, that much more difficult for you to win the trust of locals and so forth. So one such instance was in in uh, the two th summer of 2011. So this is, you know, eight months of Arab Spring, the uprisings had happened and so forth. The rebels in Libya had marched on Tripoli to take it over. So this was in Ramadan and they had done their final push uh, in the second half of Ramadan and we went to cover it there. So this is uh, Tripoli. It was, uh, you know, scorching hot. 
uh, it was August of 2011, if I remember correctly. And um, we flew from, uh, from Al Jazeera's headquarters in Qatar, we flew to uh, Tunisia. Uh, and then fr from Tunisia, we drove across the border, across the Western part of uh, Libya to get to Tripoli. Um, so the, the, the challenge was, you know, we are out there, you're, it's not only super hot and you're, and, you're, and you're fasting, but also because it's a war zone, you've got to wear the flak jackets, the bulletproof vests, right? So these weigh about 15 kilos each. They're metal plates that you're wearing. So you're wearing them and you're wearing the helmet in the heat and fasting. It's a great recipe for dehydration and just to pass out basically in terms of uh, how it was. Um, so I remember that was a, from a physically challenging perspective. But the interesting thing was that when we got to Tripoli, um, the uh, there was no hotels there that you could book because all the hotels that were there existed either the uh, Gaddafi regime particularly his son and his entourage of people had been using it as their base because they were moving remember NATO was bombing from the time and so forth people were moving mm -hmm. from place to place or there were some hotels that journalists were using but they were the journalists who had been allowed in during the Gaddafi time so they had already taken those places except one hotel which was the Radisson hotel all the international journalists kind of converged on that hotel. And, you know, the, there's like only a few hundred rooms there, tops, and there's like maybe 500 journalists trying to get in and so forth. The staff at the hotel, many of them had fled uh, because this had been a war zone for uh, a good, the best part of that year. So what ended up happening the next day, we, by the time I drove in, I drove in in the evening. The next day we were fasting, it was throughout the whole day. We get there for a start time, and we want to eat, obviously we're not quite sure what to eat or where we can eat. Um, and the wives of some of the rebel fighters decided to set up a soup kitchen for the international journalists, essentially. So they set up, a, you know, they had made this uh, uh, Harira, uh, a very famous uh, uh, North African soup. Um, to be honest, I don't know whether it was because we were fasting, I was so tired, but it really was really, uh, tasty. Um, I tried actually to go for a second plate and then I got told off by one of the fighters with his machine gun. Um, so I chose not to argue with him. But that was one of the interesting kind of experiences there covering uh, covering uh, a war zone during, during Ramadan. How do you, I mean, you do have the choice in those situations to not fast because you are traveling, you're not working. What aspects, you know, what keeps you going in those situations? Say it's not, so, you're wearing a bulletproof vest, you're traveling. So in, in that specific in, instance, to be honest, why I, why I chose not to fast purely, there's two reasons. One, because not fasting wasn't going to make much of a difference because there was no shops there anyway. So the best I could do would be drinking water. It's not like you could eat or so forth. But the second reason, because like I say, this was Libya, it was essentially a civil war. There was a lot of suspicion. There was an Al Jazeera journalist who had unfortunately lost his life, who was killed a few months earlier. So trust is a very important thing amongst the locals to keep to stay alive as a journalist during situations like this. So some uh, people may not necessarily have the Islamic knowledge or awareness that somebody who is traveling doesn't need to fast, right? Or, and so forth, or because they will be hear us speaking in English to our security team who are with us and so forth, already there's that kind of suspicion. So one of the reasons it's, yes, you've got to fight through it and, and fast purely because it's safer for you in that situation so that people understand that you're a Muslim, you're one of them and so forth to, to just to keep you safe. So that was more, more, more of it. But in terms of the faith and what that does, I think again, if I, you know, at the time I was younger, my, you know, this is 10, 11 years ago. So I was, you know, in my late twenties, I was 27 at the time, uh, 26, 27 at the time, uh, 27. Anyway, uh, that, so that, you know, you have that health, you have the ability to, to do it. I feel like if you, if I'm able to and, and do it, where I think faith plays a role, uh, we, was if you allow me, I'll, I'll relay another story when we were, we were covering uh, uh, something during Ramadan, which was in 2014, 
there was the push against um, ISIS in Mosul, right? Uh, so ISIS had taken already uh, several areas, and now there was a push by um, you know some of the Peshmerga forces in northern Iraq, international coalition, and so forth. What I was covering there was more the humanitarian fallout. So there was a huge flow of refugees who had come to these refugee camps that were now set up around Erbil in northern Iraq. Again, you know, it's Ramadan time and a lot of these refugees are coming there waiting for, for handouts or they're waiting to, for, for, for the charities there or the UN or other uh, bodies to be able to provide for them you're not going to go there and start eating anyway, even if it wasn't Ramadan in, in the midst of these things. And, and it helps, again, to put perception. And I think from a, from a, when you're asking about how faith helps, when you look at a lot of these situations, and you'll see children that look like either your own children or your nieces and nephews and any relatable faces of it, um, it really does, or at least when I speak with, with some of my colleagues, and, you know, everyone deals with the, the stress or trauma that they see or witness in a different way. For me, I think the concept of rida, right, of, of being uh, content with what God has given you, but more than content, being grateful for what God has given you, uh, is something that helps uh, kind of center me in situations uh, post this. So when you're there, you see what's happening, you see, a, you know, uh, what people are suffering through and you remember that, okay, this is only a week deployment or two week deployment. I'm going back home to Doha or to London or to anywhere else, right? For these, this is their day in, day out life. And therefore, yes, Ramadan for us is a nice month that uh, will, 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 will remind us of things. However, these situations and the, what we witness are also things that will remind us how we should be grateful throughout. It's um, that, that's very touching, and you're right. It's almost just sort of seeing what other what you other people don't have does remind you of what you do have. And in these situations, when you are in when you have been in situations of conflict, um, just one more question on this one: How do you um, how do you feel Ramadan impacts conflict in, in the Middle East? Do you think it brings communities together, or is there like more peace during those times? Are, are people actively reflecting or are they not taking that into you know, consideration at, at all because we're talking about countries so that there is a strong Muslim base? I think it's important to look at the history of Ramadan, right? So Ramadan, prior to the revelation to the Prophet ﷺ, Ramadan was a special month for the Arabs anyway, right? So histor we're talking about for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, Ramadan mm -hmm. has always had its place in society some of my, uh, so I'm originally from Egypt, some of uh, my uh, Coptic Christian friends uh, look forward to Ramadan. I wouldn't say in the same way that we look forward to it as Muslims, but it does uh, have a, a, a role in them. Culturally, it's there. It's a special month, whether that's manifested through the special food that comes out or whether it's manifested through the TV drama series that, that goes there or whether it's manifested through the spiritual retreats that Muslims will have uh, or the kind of religious aspect of it, uh, it's there. Um, coming to, let's say, not the, like taking off my journalist hat now and looking at some of the work that I do in terms of consultancy and whatnot, definitely I've seen conflict for, well, there's two ways of looking at it. When I, when I was talking to you about the Libya ex experience, for example, Libya, that was the middle of a, it was a war. It was a civil war, essentially. And they decided to launch a battle in Ramadan. But the idea for them and what spurred them on was that they were, it was an uprising against uh, an oppressive dictator. And therefore, the spirit of Ramadan is what galvanized people to push for the capture or the liberation of the capital, right? So it can have that impact. But it can also have an impact where you look to see uh, specific uh, conflict resolutions being, you, uh, the, you know, the time being used for that. So, for example, we're talking now, uh, I mean, Doha, there is a push to try and reignite the Afghan peace talks. There is delegations from uh, Pakistan, Turkey, Russia here to meet with the Taliban delegation here to try and get uh, 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 that. So it, it, it has often been used as a, as a time to try and maybe use that reflection in it to defuse situations and so forth. On a 
cultural level, let's say on a popular level, um, it is definitely something that brings people together, you know, whether it's through the, obviously now we're in COVID, but whether it's through the the simple act of communal iftars or tarawih that takes place, or in Qatar they have something which is very similar to this. They have it; it's a it's a unique uh, Khaliji thing. So they have it in Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and other places, which is very similar to uh, trick or treat in Halloween, right? To mark the middle of Ramadan, mm-hmm. they have something called uh, they call it garangao, where the kids go out and essentially they sing Ramadan songs in front of your doorstep, and you give them sweets, right? Um, so it's mainly treat or treats. There's no trick involved, but you know. So there, there, there are a lot of those things that do bring people together, and it, it, it definitely that communal aspect of it is something that uh, that's underpinned throughout. It sounds very different to Ramadan um, in the UK because you're saying you, you grew up in the UK, and yes. um, how how long have you sort of, have you been living in? Doha? So I I live. I mean, I, I grew up, I stayed in, in the UK until I graduated. So, you know, I was born in Scotland and then we moved when I was five or six. And then I stayed the rest of my life in London. And I, I left when I was 22, 23. Um, it is different. And to be honest, I'm not sure which I prefer because um, I did genuinely enjoy Ramadan in London. Obviously, my parents were there, my brothers and sisters, my siblings. That plays a role in it. But also, I remember university days, you know, the iftars that we would do, uh, the money we'd collect at the prayer rooms to, to, to fund those iftars for the, for, for the month, um, you know, getting them, trying to negotiate with different like chicken and chip shops to get us, you know, cheaper discounts for, 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 the, for, the, for the people there. The Islam awareness events you do, the kind of open iftar events, you know, it was before, I mean, it wasn't called open iftar, but you do open iftars with other uh, societies, with other uh, student union bodies and so forth. So definitely that had its own um, flavor to it. And, you know, as Iman said, there was no such thing as like things pausing for Ramadan, you know. So my last Ramadan, I remember at university, uh, it was just when the day was starting to get a bit longer. You guys will laugh now, but it was just, it, it, I think iftar was at 7.30, right? And that was like the longest it had ever been, uh, for me at least, right? I grew up when I first started fasting, I, you know, when I was in uh, early teens, iftar was at like 3.45 p.m. or 4 p.m., right? So December moving onwards. Mm-hmm. So, so that was the, the longest it had ever been, and it was a difficult one. Um, so I remember that, and I remember how, that, you know, how, how good it was um, in terms of despite the fact that it was long and it was difficult, you're there with, 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 uh, with your friends, with, with other people at university, and it was, it was a different experience. It, it does sort of, you're right, it does galvanize. You just keep you going when you have that... Um everyone's in a similar situation you've just got to get through it or especially if it's around exam time or term time it, it can be it can be quite challenging and actually a really nice thing leads on to our next question which is from, from Shabana and Shabana asks how did you get into journalism uh that's a good question and I wish I knew the answer <laughs> I it's it's uh it's an interesting one I never studied journalism. I had never, I didn't, I, it was never an interest. You know, even when I was a kid, I think I went from fireman to president, right? And everything else and footballer and all those other ones, right? But journalist was never one of those. Um, and my, you know, as I grew up, my main uh, inclination was to go into law. Uh, and then uh, in my A levels, I changed that, um, and I thought uh, I wanted to study history. I was always fond of history. My grandfather, Allah Rahmo, was a historian. My father, Allah Rahmo, was also a historian. Um, so for me, history was always something at home. We, you know, we, and it was something I was interested in. My sister, I have a sister who is a year and a bit older than me, um, and many years wiser. Uh, she studied history. So academically, she was a year older than me. She was studying history at Kings. And I got my A-level results and I'd applied to go to King's. I had an offer to go to King's. And she said to me, uh, I hope you're ready for the 1500 word essay that you've got to do every week. So, uh, which I thought she was pranking. I thought she was joking. And I said, yeah, of course, yeah. She said, no, seriously. I said, are you joking? Like, she said, yeah. So at which point I said, well, I know myself, there's no way I'm writing 1500 words a, a week, you know? So I turned down the offer and I started looking for something else to do. And I figured, well, uh, you know, history is something that I have a passion for. I'll be reading it anyway. Let me look for something completely different. 
and I ended up studying economics uh, at uh, SOAS, but because I hadn't done any maths for my A-levels, I had to pick a language, so I did economics and Arabic at SOAS. Um, so that was my degree, and I did that and at university, uh, and I hope my mother's not watching, although she knows this probably, I didn't really go to many lectures uh, in so much as I was a lot more involved in student activism. At the time, it was, you know, post 9-11, there was the build up to the uh, Iraq war, um, and then there was the 7-7 bombings. There was a lot more of that, you know. It was the first time as a Muslim community we were getting actively involved through FOSIS, uh, Federation of Student Islamic Societies in uh, the National Union of Students. So it was actually the first uh, uh, FOSIS candidate to be elected onto the NUS executive at the time. Um, so that, and, and why this, you'll see the link now to the journalism, that, that then pushed me to be a lot more vocal in terms of um, when there was news reports about terrorism, about the Muslim community in the UK, extremism and so forth, I would often go and commentate on these issues. Um, subconsciously, or even consciously, I was very much aware of how reporting impacted my life. So whether it was my sisters who were hijab being attacked in the streets, or whether it was me then later on uh, applying for jobs and being unable to maybe secure them because of my name, or whether it was because of you know uh, the comments that were being made and so forth, that there was a very clear for me trajectory between how uh, uh, my identity was being reported in the media and how that impacted my everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to correct that and rectify that. But I was trying to rectify that through an advocacy perspective, through politics. So in 2006, I was a Labour Party candidate for the council elections for Oxford South. Um, and that was all my, that's it. I had decided I'm going to go into politics, right? Then uh, those elections I lost. Um, and I was working at the time doing projects with uh, the then mayor of London, Ken Livingston, on the London stakeholders team and a few other things. That uh, ended the, that work. And I went to, on holiday to Egypt. While I was in Egypt, I got a phone call from uh, a friend of mine who had moved to Doha, to Al Jazeera, to work there, and said, hey, uh, sorry, no, before that, actually in March uh, of that year, I went, to Al Jazeera, I, I went to give a talk in Doha, I was invited, uh, Al Jazeera has an annual forum where they uh, you know, discuss global issues, so one of the things they were talking about was Arab and Muslim youth in the West, so I mm -hmm. went to speak as an Arab and Muslim youth there. Uh, then in the summer they said, oh, well, you know, we're launching this English channel. How about you come? And I said, you guys joking, like I'm going to leave London, the most cosmopolitan city in the world. You know, it's amazing. It's London. Nothing compares to it. And move to tiny Doha, right? Where there's like, you know, and I was like, no, thank you. But no, thank you. I said, no, just come, you know, we're going to put you up here for a few days. Just let's have a discussion and then we'll see. So I, I figured, you know what, my holiday in Egypt had ended. I wasn't that keen on going back as much as I loved London. I think it was like raining every day uh, during that summer. So I was like, you know what, let me just go and see what they want. So I came, they made me on offer. I was like, I'll think about it. Went back to London uh, and a few, it took me a few weeks and I was like, you know what, I'll just check it, check it out. And I fully expected to come here for a year, 18 months, and that's it. And that was in September of 2006. So... And that you is say that well you're, you're missing the rainy british summers which are still, still a thing as yeah <laughs> no i so, come back in the summer just to check in on them don't worry so. <laughs> then checking on the rain yeah. um, we've got some interesting questions about um your journalism and um your career so and there's a couple of i have a former colleague by the way on here i see bilal bilal randiri from south africa um but he he stuck true to his um his targets, because he only did a couple of years and then and then he fled. To South Africa or to London? Uh, I think, no, I think now, Bilal, you're in Norway, I believe. I follow. Oh, I gosh. I think. Uh, Finland, actually. Finland, sorry. Oh, Finland, Slam Bilal. So I guess it's very different than there, right? 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 Uh, Salams, yes. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's quite different. We, um, we have... Uh, extremely early sunrise and extremely late sunset but i was going to say does the sun actually set there this this time yeah. of year so at the moment it actually does set it sets around i think it's about 9 30 or 10 o'clock which is not too late uh but as it gets deeper into summer then there's um 
well, certainly places in the, in the country where the sun doesn't set at all. Um, and there's different, I guess, different communities. The community that we've connected with have, um, um, I mean, I, w- I wouldn't say they're the local community. They, 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 it's what was, from what I understand, a Tata community that settled here a long time ago, like way before World War One, apparently. And um, they follow uh, Makka time. So uh, uh, I, I guess for the, for the newer communities like Somali or Pakistani communities that have settled more recently, the mosques there uh, still follow sunrise and sunset, like uh, actual sunrise and sunset. Um, yeah, but um, sorry. Um, That's okay. Like, like Cuba and St. Jamal, a very, very different flavor of Ramadan. And um, we've got some questions for you. And then one question um, before we get on to the other questions is you spoke about, you know, your sisters and, um, you know, you said they wore a job and they also had experienced difficulties um, in, in, you know, after 9-11 and 7-7, um, which for Muslims was a very difficult time um, for us all. But um, when it comes to um, Doha, a conversation that we have been having um, on during this Ramadan is how easy is it for them to pray or prayer spaces for women in uh, Doha and uh, access for female Muslims in Doha to prayer spaces? Is that a thing? Because it's- I'll I'll tell you it's uh, comparative to uh, the rest of the the Muslim world that I've I've traveled extensively through. Qatar is actually very, very good with regards to this. Um, So, uh, whether it's in the malls or whether it's the masajid themselves, there, there is always plenty of space. So, you know, and, and, and it's also very accessible, not just in terms of gender, but also in terms of um, uh, abilities. So I know when my mother comes sometimes and stays with me, uh, she's, you know, in her 70s, she'll, uh, it's always been easy to kind of like drive up to, uh, you know, the, mo- the main mosques and have a, a very accessible entrance to that. Um, and, and they're good. You know, one of the best things actually, there's a new city uh, that they've been building called Lusail, right? This is where the World Cup final stadium is going to be. It's meant to host, uh, like house 200,000 people there and stuff. It has a, like a waterfront walk on it. And they, what they've done is they've installed these rollout carpets or rugs, right? Uh, they're just there every, every however many hundred meters. Um, and you, so it's for you to, if you want to pray, you roll out the rug you pray on it and it rolls back. So it's like a essential open air prayer facility there. Um, and, you know, some of them have like hedges around them for those who want to pray a bit more kind of privacy on it or whatnot, but they're just, uh, so in terms of accessibility, in terms of uh, prayer spaces, it's one of the best things to be honest. I know, for example, when I do go back to see my family in London, um, you know, if you're out and you want to pray before uh, the, the time's over, sometimes, you know, you've got to go into like a changing room in a mall or like find somewhere or whatever, right? Here, you, if you, you'll be hard not to find a place you can pray uh, as in a, an actual prayer room or, or a thing. But even if you don't, if you, no one's going to blink twice and look at you wherever you pray, whether it's in the airport before you leave or whether it's in the middle of a petrol station, if you, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and that's actually been the, been the case more so recently because they only open the mosques f- because of COVID for prayer times and there's a limited capacity and then they shut them, right? So sometimes you're not going to make that jama'a or you're in the middle of something. So you'll just, uh, everyone's got their own prayer rug as well anyway in their car now because of the whole situation. So you'll find people just, you know, pulling up on the side of the road, coming out, praying and so forth. Fantastic. And it's great you know, that situation for women as well. Um, often find, yeah, airports, are generally very good in my experience. Always find I always find a good press space at the airport. On, um, on the on the on the on the point absolutely. of women, actually, I'll tell you as well. We have for so obviously the the current ruler of Qatar, the Amir, his mother, uh, Sheikh Moza, is um, uh, who is the wife of obviously the former uh, ruler, uh, has a very prominent role in society as well, right? So she was one of the people who set up Qatar Foundation, which has. Uh, a lot of different uh, educational institutions in it and so forth, but it has a great mosque, this modern mosque, right? That uh, actually people actually either love it or hate it because it's very futuristic the way it's done, right? So more traditionalist people would rather something that's a lot more thing. And, but 
there's no doubt that it's a very appealing mosque, right, or interesting. Um, and often in one of the things where we used, obviously we haven't gone to Tarawih now for, for this year and past, but she would come and pray Tarawih. Uh, so you would see her or uh, some of the other uh, 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 female figures in, in or public figures. So that's always been something as well that, that uh, uh, I think has encouraged um, the institutions to ensure that there were uh, spaces for women to, to, just as there is obviously for men here. Oh, wow, that, that's absolutely fantastic and really useful to know. Um, that actually um, moves on nice to our next question. So Iman was asking, which, which links to what you've said, um, being in journalism for so long, how do you deal with the narrative of Muslims around the world more often than not being negative? Um, we live in a world now where there is such distrust towards the media. How do you navigate it? Because it's, it's easy to be a Muslim in a country where there are Muslims, but generally... How do you find that? True. That's that's true. It definitely is true. Um, however, to be fair, for, from a journalistic perspective, you know, uh, when you go into a newsroom, especially an international newsroom, uh, it's often the case in Al Jazeera is no different. That you're still on the minority, right? Uh, so, in the end of the day, Al Jazeera is not a it's not a Muslim media network, right? It it's, it may be owned by a, a, a Muslim majority uh, country. However, it's not a it's not a religiously oriented. Uh, it's, it's an international news network. So when you walk into that newsroom, uh, more often than not, you are the minority, and more often than not, you are combating uh, a narrative. I remember, for example, having a very heated discussion with uh, one of my uh, uh, seniors um, back during when ISIS first came, and uh, with those issues where it really. You know, you, you sometimes, you, it's just very frustrating. So there's the, the, the flag that ISIS wanted to use is a, is a black flag, and it's the flag that has the seal of the Prophet, right? For me, that is not, uh, uh, that's no, no, you know, that is not the ISIS flag. It is the, the seal of the Prophet, the same way that the Union Jack is not the BMP flag, right? Or the US flag is not the KKK flag and so forth, right? Just because somebody uses it, it doesn't mean that it's theirs. And in fact, lazy journalism by, by calling it that is what allows them to misappropriate it, okay? So I remember there was a report that uh, I was taking over somebody else's, one of the journalists had done a night, uh, an eve overnight version of an event where ISIS had taken over some area and they had planted the flag there. And I was meant to update that report the next day and the opening, of the report was uh, something along the lines of the ISIS flag firmly planted or hoisted or whatever, right? And I said, I'm not gonna write that. He said, why? I said, because, and I explained it. He said, no, I think we should because people see it as that. I said, well, people see it as that because we tell them it's that. If you stop telling them it's that, then they're not gonna see it as that, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a very, you know, it was a very thing. And I, for me, you know, sometimes you have to take a, uh, you know, it was, he's my senior. Uh, ultimately, there is a, a there is a, a what do you call it structure or whatever you call it hierarchy, right? But you have to then decide what se uh, uh, sits best with you, right? Is it something you're you're ready to risk your? I mean, I to be fair, I didn't think it would risk my career. I, I, I'm very well established that I knew, even though he's my senior, I, I could stand my ground. But for other people, you could. So I, you know, I, I decided it would mean at least that you're going to come in, you're going to clash with this person throughout the rest of your career. The worst case, the best case scenario, and you decide when to take those situations. I think, so to answer the question, I think you need to be unapologetic, is my view, about what you believe in. Understand what you believe in, understand the nuances of it, be well equipped to fight your corner, but once you have those, don't take shit from anybody, is my view, and, and stand up for it if you believe in it, because Often the case is where the reason why we find ourselves where we find ourselves in, where we're misreported on or misrepresented and so forth. Part of it is due to, let's say, ignorance. Part of it is due to a more, um, uh, let's say, uh, a, 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 uh, those with bad, ill-intentioned uh, agenda against us. But also part of it is due to us not standing up for ourselves, not uh, reclaiming our own narrative. Right. And that in that, I think is something very important that we do need to reclaim our narrative. We are the ones who should be setting it and talking about it, not in an arrogant way to say, oh, you don't understand or whatever. But no, there are certain things that, yes, we need to talk about. It's not right for us to uh, allow people to uh, 
uh, take our own symbols, whether it is that or whether it's hijab or whether it's uh, whatever it is, pick something. And for them to decide for us what it means, that this is a symbol, you know, where they say, oh, they don't look like, a, he doesn't look like an extremist. He doesn't have a beard. Where's the logic in that, you know? Uh, when, when you let comments like that slide or you don't challenge them, that is as much of a reason why we would find the kind of uh, misrepresentation about Islam in the media, as is those who have, like I say, ill-intentioned or an anti-Muslim agenda. Thank you. Um, and that leads on to maybe our last question. Um, I, I understand it's your alarm is in six minutes until um, iftar for you. Would that be correct? Um, Sahawazin asks, um, what advice would you give to yourself or your younger self at the start of your career? What would, what, what would you say to yourself? What would you have given yourself? We should have started with that question because I don't think six minutes is enough. There's a lot, there's a lot of uh, a lot of advice, I guess. Um, uh, there's other, I tell you, I was fortunate. Alhamdulillah, I'm I'm the youngest of five siblings, right? And um, uh, although maybe I, I I don't express to to my brothers and sisters uh, a lot, but I, I'm fortunate enough to have grown up uh, looking up to them and seeing uh, their achievements as well as sometimes their mistakes. It's good being young because the elder ones get to do the mistakes and you learn from it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not, not just from that perspective. I think they, they achieved a lot and they did a lot. And I think uh, that for me is something that, that's helped me. So I, I was blessed to be able to have advice at a younger age, um, not necessarily directly in that way, but at least practically uh, seeing it. Um, if there was a few things I would, I would go back in time and say, um, one would, uh, would be to, uh, not necessarily not to, not, not to be in a rush. It's, it's good to, to try and achieve quickly, but, uh, but to kind of be aware of time in a different way, right? So when we're younger, you you fall into I would say one. Generally, people fall into one of two categories: either kind of people who just want to you know achieve really quickly and finish and so forth, right? And either they will never perfect what they're doing, or sometimes they'll miss things on the way and so forth. Or those who are like super chilled and laid back and be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm still young. And then the next thing they know, it they're like 50 years old and like you know those years have gone, right? Um, sorry, if anyone's 50 years old, that's still young. Don't take offense, it's all relative, but you know what I mean, right? So, um, so that's the, 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 there's usually, we need to find a medium in that. You need to find a medium whereby you have the, um, that incentive uh, and, and the vigor to want to achieve and to want to change things, but in a kind of gradual way. And I think this, if, I, if you allow me, I'm not I'm by no means uh, uh, you know, a, a religious scholar by any, any means, but to take up on what I've learned from, from other people is that you know, this concept of uh, being a middle way in Islam and this concept of gradualism is central to everything. So we, when you look at the message of the Prophet, uh, it was all about gradualism. So whether it is through him receiving it after 40 years of his life and then receiving it over a time span of over 20 years, or whether it is the edicts that came out. So whether we're looking at uh, things that were slowly made not permissible, so whether it's alcohol and so forth, or whether it is things that were made mandatory in terms of the five, you didn't wake up and suddenly have five pillars that you had to do, right? They, everything was done in a gradual way, but there was always conviction. So that he had clarity as to what his message was, that you will submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you will uh, do good, that you will, are here to take care of society and better it and elevate people. So that's, yeah. and there, there was always vigor. They would always fight for that. You would sacrifice for that. You would give your life for it. However, so that's, that's the vigor element of it. But the gradualism, and this is what allows you to maintain stamina throughout. So what I found in my career is that sometimes I f by, uh, there are some periods where I feel burnt out, right? Um, because I've pushed really hard. So I really wanted to go, I, you know, I wanna go and cover this story and that story and that story and I'm traveling from here and here and here. But really, maybe it would have been better just to focus on one or two stories, get those done in a, in a better way, but also learn from those experiences. 
Um, so I think understanding time, and that's maybe the most difficult thing. I think that's a life lesson that everyone struggles with is like how to value time as best as possible and how to utilize it as best as possible. And maybe that's also the one piece of advice that a younger version of me would have hated to hear the most. Whenever anybody used to speak to me about time, I'd be like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I'm going to be doing this. But in reality, they did know what they were talking about. Um, we were just too young to appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we have about a minute now left in Bilbao. I just wanted to um, say another thank you um, once more again. Um, Jamal, it's been an absolute oh, pleasure. pleasure. It's been fantastic, engaging, very, very interesting. Thank you so much for taking your time to share you know, your insights and your experiences for us all. And I'm sure everyone who's still fasting, um, like myself, we're feeling a lot more invigorated uh, as well after listening to, to your challenges and your stories. And um, I just want to say just a big thank you once more to our um, Islam channel, who's our media partner this year, and also to the Arts Council UK for making this event possible. You can read more about how we're fighting world hunger with Islamic relief at iiuk.co forward slash rcp. And um, Ramadan is a month of charity and giving. So we'd like to encourage you to support the Ramadan tent project and help us to continue our work because your support is vital to keeping events like these going as the world transitions to normality and as well as our open iftars, our sunnah fast and our other projects. And please check out the link in the chat box for more information. And you can donate to our online at launchwood.com forward slash RTP 2021. So over to my colleague now for um, Azan. Thank you again. Uh, before you do that, then I just wanted to say salam alaikum to Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul. Uh, it seems I only ever say salam once a year on this open iftar with him. It's been a couple of years since we last met. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's nice just catching the tail end of you. Jazakallah khair yeah. and Allah thank you for your inspiration. Ya Allah shukran. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. اللهم إني لك صمت وبك آمنت وعلى رزقك أفطرت ذهب الظمأ وبتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول Hi, 
everyone thank you once more for joining us today we've just finished in um, Doha so we're in Cape Town now so a big welcome thanks again to our um, global iftar 2021 which is brought to you by the Ramadan tent project and global iftar is the world's largest virtual iftar we, are, we began in London and we've been following the sun across the globe to the US Australia Qatar now in South Africa and our next stops will be Turkey and then back to London again and thank you so much for joining us today in Cape Town in South Africa. My name is Farah and together with Adnan, who will be joining us shortly, um, will be your host for this evening. We have an exciting event planned for this evening with Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul. And before we get started, I'd like to first thank our media partner for this year Islam Channel and give a special welcome to those joining us from Islam Channel's Facebook and YouTube. And it's a pleasure to have you with us today. I'd also like to thank the Arts Council UK, whose help has allowed us to continue our work this Ramadan. All of our work is available on, on our website, and our work this Ramadan is supported by Islamic Relief, who are our charity partner. And you can check out the work that Islamic Relief does at iruk.co forward slash RTP. For those joining us for the first time, our events are interactive, and I'd like to encourage everyone to hop on the Zoom. Um, and for those who are comfortable, do turn on your cameras. It'll be lovely to interact with you and see you all. And also, if you're joining from Islam Channel's Facebook or YouTube or our um, Facebook or YouTube, just jump on the Zoom at RamadanTentProject.com. And it's really, really easy to connect. And that will enable us to interact with you and for you to interact with our speaker as well today. So with a quick uh, run through the tech, you'll find at the bottom of your screens, there's a more um, section on your mobile. And there's a reactions option there, so you can show us how you're feeling in real time. There's also a raise hand option as well if you want to ask our speakers a question or if you'd like to add to the discussion. And somebody from our back end will unmute you. So first of all, over to you, Adnan. How are you doing? Salam alaikum. Welcome, Salam Farah. Uh, how everyone? How's everyone doing as well? I'm good. Um, I was obviously trying to sign in as you do with Zoom, but it doesn't work. But we're here. Um, thank you for the introduction as well. Great to see you again. Great to see how the global iftar is really taking place at the moment um, now in South Africa as well. So so great to actually be here and and, and see what's what, what's happening. Um, just run me through how how has it been so far? How's the experience been? I want to I want to hear from not only yourself, Farah, but also the audience as well. Of how has the global iftar really um, been and, and experience? I think Imam's been doing a lot of the hard work. So I'm gonna. Iman to comment on that because Iman has been a star keeping things running in the background. So, thanks. That's a very high praise. Um, I feel like I've barely done anything. You guys are doing the heavy lifting, uh, hosting and all that. But uh, yeah, it's been great. It's such a rush actually because we're doing it twenty four hours, so we're all doing it in shifts, and then like you know checking in with each other to see how the last session went. So it's really the sense of camaraderie that's amazing. We did it last year as well. So I don't know. It's, it's just great, you know, being in lockdown, but then still being connected like this. It's such a good feeling. Alhamdulillah, it's been good. 
How about yourself? And how's your how's your um day been? How's your um uh, I've, I've just been back to back. Um, I've just been looking at flat viewing, going around London, trying to find places to stay, all that sort of stuff. But I've been listening in to the Global Lift Star. Um, and obviously, I think the, the team, Iman, it's, it's not just a heavy lifting for one person. I think so it's, it's a teamwork for sure. Um, and we can just see how Wazina and, and, and down at the bottom as well, who has just joined us, um, giving us a little wave. I'm going to unmute you as well and get you involved into the conversation. Um, Hi, everyone. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm okay, and the Global Lift is going well. Uh, we've got amazing uh, speakers before, uh, Yahya Ibrahim. Uh, uh, it, was, it was really cool. Uh, everything is on Facebook, of course, so if you've missed uh, any, of the, any of the talk, you can always watch them. Uh, and it's great. And, uh, and I mean, just to quickly let the viewers at home know as well, we will be going into the talk in about five minutes time. So we'll do an introduction to the speaker. However, um, Ambassador Ibrahim is actually here and I am keen to just get a quick word from him as well before we get into the actual talk. Assalamualaikum Ibrahim, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, there should be a button popping up now. Can you hear us? You right yet? Yep. I have, we start, um, um, Ambassador Ibrahim, that's a fantastic shirt you're wearing there. Well, I got it in True African Japan, style. Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> you no, know, it's the kind of shirt that Nelson Mandela made famous. Because when he came out of prison, he wasn't comfortable in a suit and he changed the entire dress code to what was now formal. I believe he even met your queen in a shirt like this. So I think he's restated the fashion. Thing, and he brought it all the way from the Indonesian slaves who were brought to Cape Town and who became the first Muslim community there. So that's where the oh, show wow. is. What an introduction, I suppose. <laughs> sure. That's fantastic. I, I didn't realize it come from um, Indonesian slaves, so you definitely enlightened us there. Thank you. And, and, and the bookshelf at the back as well. I think that's the one that caught my eyes the most. I, can't, I want to guess the number of books there are. I'm going to go with 350. I'm not too sure, I've not done an inventory, but you know, we, after years and decades of public service and moving to the US and moving into official residences, we've now moved into what we hope inshallah will be our last abode before the Akhira. And um, for the first time I've unpacked all my boxes with all my books, I've got them all in this whole place around me and um, alhamdulillah, it is just a wonderful thing to have them here. So I don't know how many books there are. I'll do an inventory one day. I'm just glad that they are out, that they are at least categorized, but they are not the job of a true librarian. That has to come still. Well, we're hoping that in the time we'll, we'll hear more about some of, your, um, some of the knowledge you've gained from the books as well. Um, just before as well, we go into it, I'm a bit more keen to find out how things are in South Africa at the moment. We love these interactions. We love to be able to get involved with not only the audience, but speakers as well. And because it's a global left hour, we want to know what's happening in South Africa. Look, I think that um, we all have very good memories of South Africa, the anti-apartheid struggle. Some of your parents may have been involved in boycotting some fruit and other products that came. And so we are very thankful to the world. And I think that South Africa has been going through a tough time in the last decade. Partially, it is by things done to us, like global recessions and all of those kind of things. But partially, it's been self-inflicted. I think some of our leaders fell into the temptation of corruption and some of those kind of things. And so in true Ramadan spirit, it's a cleansing process in South Africa we are hoping that this will be a Ramadan in which the most corrupt people will get out of office. They will be put in jail and put on trial, some of them. So I think we are living out um, Ramadan in that sense of the word. But the Muslim community is as strong as ever. The place is vibrant across the country with Qirat, with Tarawih, with fasting and um, charity, most importantly, looking after the poor in true South African Muslim spirit, reaching beyond ourselves. Um, and so we have um, opportunities to feed Muslim poor, but we use the opportunities also to feed the poor in general. And South Africa with a small minority of about just over one to 1 1.5 million Muslims, I think have 
a disproportionate presence of charities and philanthropies. Islamic Relief is one of the strongest ones here in South Africa, together with others um, from across the UK and across the world. So I think that there's a very vibrant Muslim community that is here in South Africa. Great. Um, I don't think I've actually been to South Africa, but now it's definitely creeping up, creeping, creeping up on my list for sure. Um, Inshallah. Inshallah. Sounds, sounds, sounds excellent. Um, just before we get into I'm going to pass on to Farah and I'm going to have to do the introduction. However, just before uh, we go into that, um, for the audience at home as well, um, so South Africa at the moment is, is one hour ahead of the UK, therefore the Azan, I believe, is at 6.06. Um, but just to confirm, is, is that the approximate right time for the yeah. Azan? Well, it's to 6.08, I think it is. But 6.08. Okay, inshallah, we'll try and aim to get the Azan for, for 6.08 p.m., yes. which means we have about 40, about 40 minutes of uh, a discussion period. Uh, we like to keep it as interactive and as open as you like, and also with some question and answer sections towards the end as well. So we can sort of play by ear as we go. But we, what, we, what we normally say is 20, 20 minutes at the beginning for your section, and then sort of question and answers after that, if that's okay with you as well. Okay, so uh, on, to, on to Farah. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um... First of all, um, uh, Ambassador Rasul, Ibrahim, even, um, I just dropped you a message. So it'd be great to um, make sure that you're happy um, contributing to the chat and seeing the chat. So feel free to interact with us via the chat as well. For those, for those who are joining us today from um, Islam channels, Facebook and YouTube and the Ramadan Tent Project, uh, Facebook and YouTube, jump on if you can, keep it interactive. Let's have, you know, lots of your comments, uh, lots of your questions. And um, I really can't wait to hear, you know, what, what we're going to be hearing about today. Um, so for those who are just joining us, um, Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul is a former distinguished scholar in residence at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. He works in the al Walid in Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, advancing an alternative paradigm to the inertia of orthodoxies in the face of extremism. He is the founder of the World for All Foundation and his endeavours to create a world of coexistence that is safe for difference. And um, Ambassador Rasul has um, completed a term of service as South Africa's ambassador to the US. And he's previously also served as a member of parliament in South Africa's National Assembly and been a special advisor to the state president. And during his term as ambassador, he also received a, a, the award for lifetime commitment to human rights by shared interest in New York and uh, the inaugural Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Press Club in Washington. He's a founder of the World for All Foundation and is active in rethinking intellectual tools for cooperation and relations between faiths, cultures, and communities at a global level, as well as establishing dignity, inclusion, and equity for those marginalized and um, excluded. So today we are going to be speaking about, hearing a little about Ramadan and the soft power of um, Islam, so, over to you. Thank you very much, Farah. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have reached yet another month of Ramadan. I must say that I say this with a lot more meaning nowadays because COVID-19 has shown just how vulnerable we are. And the fact that reaching Ramadan was not something that you could take for granted. And I think that um, we are very fortunate that we are here and therefore we must participate in Ramadan 2021 and the remainder of Ramadan with a greater consciousness because of the blessing that we have absolutely reached this month. I thought in my own reflections on Ramadan, what stands out for me over all of these years, 59 almost, uh, minus maybe nine, 50 years of, of fasting consistently as much as possible. I think that each act of worship in Islam has a purpose. It has a compliance aspect to it. There are some things that you must just do there are rules to it. There are ways in which to do it. But I think we often get lost in the compliance and the rules, and we lose the sense of purpose and meaning. 
And that's why I thought maybe it would be quite interesting to adapt a chapter that I've done in a forthcoming book called The Soft Power of Islam, because I have the sense that Islam is known, if not feared, for its hard power, our ability to be brave, our invocations to jihad in the military sense of things, the fear that people feel when they see our symbols, um, the distance that people create, the laws that people try to make, travel bans and all of those kind of things. It says much about who those people are and their prejudices, their sense of discrimination, their Islamophobia, but it's also a challenge to us that maybe we have not communicated who we are, what Islam is, what the Quran says, what the example of the Prophet on whom be peace is truly in the world. And therefore we may have been responsible for hiding what is the true power of Islam. And that is the soft power of Islam. Hard power in Islam is exceptional. It's the resort that you take last. It is a defensive posture that you take um, rather than the kind of everyday position that you take. I must say that there are Muslims who are so beholden to hard power that they may even compromise the soft power that Islam is known for. So Joseph Nye um, from Harvard he said that some of the elements of soft power is the ability to be diplomatic, to put your best foot forward. It's about your culture, not your military. It's about your history, not your anger today. It's about your authentic narrative. It's about your values. And therefore, we need to find ways in which our values can can speak for us rather than our emotions. And, and so Ramadan is now one of those global symbols. The whole world is aware of Ramadan and they are aware of our sacrifices. But so we are admired for our ability to abstain from food and drink and all the things which are normally normal for us are we communicating a narrative of what Ramadan is? And so I thought, how does Ramadan evoke and promote the, what I call the seven coordinates of soft power? And so of course, and I'll rattle through this and we can talk about it. The first coordinate of soft power in Islam is Tawheed, the unity of Allah. That's the fountainhead of everything we think, everything we do, everything we exude. And at the core of it is unity and integration, the unity of God and the unity of creation. And therefore, there should be integrity and balance. And Ramadan teaches us how to reintegrate ourselves, how to remove our desires, our egos, how to put ourselves at the service of Allah. But most importantly, Ramadan reestablishes our vertical connection as individual human beings to our creator, but at the same time, our horizontal connection to other human beings and other creation. And that really is the first coordinate that I think we must cultivate in this month of Ramadan. Service to Allah, um, Worship of Allah and service to creation. The second coordinate is justice. Justice is our lodestar, our guiding light in a troubled world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that had Allah not checked one people against another, the world would surely have fallen into disorder. So justice is those unfortunate things we have to do because there is a threat to the world. And Ramadan teaches us the solidarity with those who are in trouble, those who are oppressed, those who are facing the brunt of injustice. And sometimes we are focused correctly on the injustices against the Palestinians, 
increasingly we're including the Rohingya, the Uyghur Muslims, uh, the, the minority Muslims who face Islamophobia. But I think justice must be for all people. Wherever people face this injustice, they must see the way in which Islam responds, because that's part of our um, soft power, the empathy with those who face injustice. The third one that I want, the third lodestar of our soft power is mercy and compassion. That's the glue that binds us. Allah tells us that Allah's mercy precedes Allah's anger. Allah encourages us, us in this month of Ramadan to seek Allah's mercy and to seek Allah's forgiveness. The very important thing that I want to say is we often seek Allah's forgiveness and Allah's mercy, but we are very reluctant to give it to others, to share that same mercy that we seek from Allah, to share it with others. That same forgiveness that we want Allah to do, we for, don't easily forgive those who may have um, trespassed against us. Um, and so this is a month in which the vertical mercy and forgiveness is sought, but at the same time, it is the month in which mercy and forgiveness must permeate horizontally um, as well. And Ramadan is all about seeking and giving mercy and forgiveness. The fourth coordinate I want to touch on is peace. Peace is the ecosystem in which the Islamic civilization flourishes. When there is war, society is reduced to one or two dimensions, a bureaucracy that collects resources and a military that fights. But when you have peace, you add your intellect. The whole civilization comes to bear. You add your literature. You add the beauty of your religion, your poetry. You add your art. You add your whole heritage. You bring that because it now has space, because nothing is only at the service of your hard power. Now your soft power can exude. And that is when the Islamic civilization flourishes. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa says that on that elusive night of Laylatul Qadr, salamun kawlam min rabbir rahim, peace descends from your Lord who is forgiving and merciful, your Lord descends peace to you. And therefore, we must not only seek and receive that peace, we must also make that peace. This is the opportunity for us to, to exhort the Afghans to find a durable peace, to the Sudanese to find a durable and sustaining peace. Wherever people are at war, how do we make peace? And, 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 and that's what Ramadan must do, that as those last 10 nights, peace descends on us from the heavens. We've got to exude it horizontally. The fifth coordinate of our soft power is where we are positioned, wasatiya, in the perfect middle, not moderate, in the middle. Re rejecting the extremes because the Prophet has said, beware of being extreme in your religion because people before you have perished, as a result of their extremism. And therefore, um, we mustn't even be extreme in our fasting because Allah wants ease for us. Allah gives us so many alternatives if fasting is too hard for those who are old. If you are sick, you can't fast. If you are too young, fast as much as what you can. Allah does not want us to make extreme shows in fasting, in worship, let alone in life. We must always position ourselves in the middle and Ramadan pulls us to that middle because it's a great leveler. The sixth coordinate, which is so fundamental in the month of Ramadan is the coordinate of knowledge. In this month, the first revelation that came down is Ikra, read. And often we stop reading the verse when we say Ikra, which other religion? has in its first revelation the entire exegesis of reading. Of, and then it goes on, Allah has taught you the use of the pen. So it's not just ikra. It is the use of the qalam, the pen. You must also write what you know. 
Allah mal insana malam yaklam. Allah teaches us that which we don't know yet. And therefore, that's the third element of knowledge to be able to research, to uncover new knowledge that is still only with Allah. Which other religion has made that? That's why the Islamic civilization needs peace in order that we can read, we can write, we can research in order to build this magnificent civilization. And once we've done that, we come to the seventh coordinate. It is of human coexistence. Because we do not stay in the middle for ourselves. We do not develop knowledge for ourselves. We don't want peace only for ourselves. We don't want mercy only for ourselves. We don't fight for justice only for ourselves. We don't believe in Tawheed as only our property. We want to integrate the world into one um, big humanity. And therefore coexistence becomes absolutely crucial because it's in the interactions with others that the, is civil, that the Islamic civilization not only thrives, but picks up new knowledge. We revolutionize maths, not because we had all the answers, but because we found the zero in India. We revolutionized knowledge, not because we had everything, but we were able to bring the printing press or ink from China to the West, and they established all of these. We revolutionized because of interactions with everyone else. The moment we started cutting ourselves off, our knowledge production ended. Our civilization became states and countries rather than civilizations. And that is really what I want to say in this month of Ramadan, that it is an opportunity for us to rededicate ourselves to the soft power of Islam. And the, every aspect of Ramadan is a emphasis on the importance of that soft power. Hard power has a place in Islam, but only as a last resort, only when you've got to defend yourself, only when there's justice to be sought for. And inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this ummah thrive again on the basis of this foundation of soft power, with the ability to be brave when we need to be brave in the cause of justice and in seeking justice, we don't do any injustice through swerving towards the extremes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, very in-depth actually, and a good list there as well. I wrote them down. Um, just, just for the audience anyway, I wanna quickly backtrack and go and um, if you can give a bit of a, I guess, definition on soft power oh. and soft Ramadan. A definition can you, of? Can you can you provide a definition of soft power in this in this in this case in terms of in Ramadan? So, soft power is. And maybe the hard power as well. Yeah, so if we look at the world today. There are nations which only work with hard power and, and they enforce their military over people. They are able to blackmail you economically. You've got to enter the economic systems to be able to get what you want from them. Otherwise you perish. And that's all the aspects of hard power. So if we understand, and they can enforce their will, they can invade your country, they can bomb you, as the Muslim world have frequently seen hard power used against them. I think that on the, on the contrary, soft power is really that your values precede your interests. Because when you only work on your interests, anything is fair game. Any weapon can be used. But when you have values that say you are essentially peaceful, that you are essentially merciful, you, your reach for hard power is more restrained. And therefore, your values must precede your interests. Secondly, your history, your deep history of civilization. You've got to show the world, for example, as Muslims, that today's Technology would not be possible had Al Khawarizmi not, for example, mastered the arts of algorithms, which is named after him. Because algorithms is the essence of today's technological revolution 
and the fourth industrial revolution that is there. But very few people, everyone says algorithms, but no one derives from it al khawarizmi The same thing, we speak about algebra today, but we don't know it is the name of a book, Al-Jabr wal Qamar. It is the perfection and the completion of equations. And so you see, our soft power got lost as we try to toe to toe it so often with the other purveyors of hard power. And so soft power is then that diplomacy, that negotiations, that dialogue that we have, it's our culture. Ramadan gives people a glimpse into who we are at our finest when we have the strength to abstain from 12 to 19 hours of any food and drink. It's amazing to people, but that is the culture that we are capable of. In the same way, um, our ability to communicate. No one communicates or listens to you when they are scared of you. You've got to relax the atmosphere. You've got to be able to create the, 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 the ability to speak and be heard, to listen and to let others speak, to debate your way through trouble, not shoot your way or threaten your way through hard questions. And, and, and so soft power is really that whole gamut of instruments. Um, at the end of the day, the Islamic civilization is the purveyor of soft power. The empire has often been the purveyor because it's maintained by hard power, by the need to expand. And that's why we resist this idea that Islam spread by the sword because everyone wants to reduce us to a power that is only hard. Whereas the truth of the matter is that you've got um, all these people across the world becoming Muslim and being Muslim because they have been attracted by the soft values of Islam. I, I really like that last point. Um, and, and, and thank you for the definition. I, I primarily asked because I wasn't too familiar with it. Um, and if there were any, it was anyone else as well. Um, but whilst you were explaining all that as well, I was speaking to Farah and, and she had a really big um, smile across the face because I believe she has experience with this before as well um, in her degree. Um, I'm going to pass on to Farah for some more questions. Thank you. Um, it, it brings back a, a lot of memories, actually. I had to do a, um, I did a podcast with um, my university colleague on comparing soft power and power dynamics. And we had to choose two very unrelated things. So we actually chose to do um, an assessment comparing the two Disney um, films, Inside Out and Frozen and the soft and hard power and how the different um, soft power theories related to that. So I remember the hard days of putting in the work into this podcast that we did. Um, so that, yeah, really made me smile about this time two years ago. So you so well traveled, as you can see by your fantastic collection of books and your wonderful stories. Um, and I know that you've been based in the US also. Um, so as a, how was your experience of Ramadan and being a Muslim in the United States and as an ambassador from South Africa to, to the United States, um, particularly, um, you know, post 9-11? And um, if you were there post 9-11, and how did that change with the, how did your expression of Islam change at all in the US compared to, you know, a Muslim country or to South Africa? So I'd be intrigued to know. No, I must say that um, the first, shock in Ramadan when you come from a southern um, hemisphere country like South Africa and you go to a northern hemisphere one like that and you arrive there in the heart of summer it's just the sheer number of hours you have to fast. Um, I think um, um, suhoor at three in the morning and, um, and, and, and iftar at 9.30 sometimes 10 o'clock at night it's a culture shock. Um, my son had just become mature when we arrived in the U.S. And um, his first experiences were your kind of 19-hour um, fasts. And he's never looked back ever since. Everything else since we've arrived in South Africa is easy. So it's the sheer hours um, that I think really strikes you. I also think that it was also very difficult because we have a big culture of Tarawih. But when Isha is only at about 11.30, 
you realize how every family has to fight to pass on the tradition, the culture, the worship to their children because um, it's not going to work when you come out of Tarawih at, at one in the morning or after midnight. So we've introduced in our family um, home of Tarawih just so that our children were familiar with the concept of Tarawih. Um, and, but you also get an opportunity to induct them in your own way of thinking um, about Ramadan and, 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 and so forth. So that's the, the, the other thing. I was fortunate because I was shielded by my position as ambassador from the day-to-day -day, um, slights and hurts that uh, Muslims often undergo in a place like the United States, even when President Obama is president, especially if there are some people who insist on calling him by his middle name, Hussein. Um, but my wife and children were not always as fortunate. My wife has, um, because of the headscarf, um, has been told to go back to Iran. Um, she's been photographed coming out of a library with books um, and all of those kind of things. And, um, and certainly, I think those who are less protected feel those everyday um, slights and, and hurts being Muslim. And it's more pronounced when you come from a country like South Africa, where Islam is not tolerated, but embraced, where um, Muslims are deeply rooted in the liberation struggle. And I keep on making this point that everyone knows that Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years. Very few people know that in the cell right next to him was Ahmed Katrada. Everyone knows that Oliver Tambo, the ANC president, was in exile for 30 years. Very few people know that with him was Dr. Yusuf Dadu. Everyone knows about Steve Biko being tortured to death um, in apartheid um, prisons. Fewer people know that also tortured to death was Imam Abdullah Harun. And so that's how deeply Islam is, is rooted. Nelson Mandela tells the story when he was on Robben Island um, about how when he was feeling very depressed, he would seek out um, solace at the Muslim grave. And when he understood the history of Qadi Abdul Salam, who's buried on Robben Island, he realized that he was not the first prisoner on Robben Island, the first political prisoner on Robben Island, but that the Muslim more than 300 years ago had been the first political prisoner of Dutch colonialism. If you then begin to understand, you come from a country in which Islam is revered because we provided most of the first slaves in South Africa. We were the ones where Islamophobia was so bad that Islam was banned for almost 200 years. That, um, that, that, that we really were part and parcel, part of the salt of the earth. And then you go to a country where you are not accepted for who you are, um, where your religion is an issue. Then you begin to, 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 to feel um, the sense of attack. And you've really got to battle your rage. And that's what Ramadan teaches us, the ability to control our rage. The things which are halal for us, we've got to control. The things which are not, we've got to, we can control and, and say no to. And so in a sense, I think that it was strange coming into the U.S. with that kind of atmosphere. But you begin um, to, to then use the fact that people are perplexed that South Africa sends a conscious Muslim to be its ambassador. And they come and they ask you, why? How did this work? And you begin to explain. And you can see the layers of prejudice falling from their eyes. And the most important lesson is that there is a way in which we must be intolerant of intolerance. But we can't be so intolerant that there's no engagement. You've got to make yourself known. You've got to 
turn Islamophobia around also person by person. You can do the big ideological number, but at the end of the day, you've got to turn Islamophobia around person by person, audience by audience, group by group. And that's, for example, the introduction. That's, for example, one of the reasons that they inaugurated a Washington Press Club um, award that I received because of the engagement and the turning around of people's prejudices. I agree, that's on mute. I, I, I want to I expand on that point. And, and, and I suppose, can you share examples, tangible examples of that as well? How did you turn it around? What, what kind of things, what challenges were there in the way? And um, what key qualities did you have to impose as well based on the seven of the qualities you mentioned? I think one of the ways was, for example, when Nelson Mandela died in 2013, um, then Vice President Biden and um, Secretary of State Kerry, they came to the South African embassy to say um, they want to do something in Washington in order um, to celebrate the life of Nelson Mandela because of his great importance. And we said, no, no, we'll do it. And they offered the Washington National Cathedral, which is really unprecedented. That's the cathedral which presidents are inaugurated and buried from. And they were going to give this honor to Nelson Mandela. And we sat down and, we, and I made it clear as ambassador that we are going to commemorate Nelson Mandela in the way that Nelson Mandela would want to be commemorated in South Africa through an interfaith service, even though Mandela was a Methodist. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point that we really got Kirat to reverberate through the Washington National Cathedral. Um, we got the South African priest to come. We got Jewish people to, 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 to come in and really to show that kind of diversity a few months later after the cathedral itself was exposed to that kind of thing and the, and the pillars of the cathedral didn't collapse because the Quran was recited um, in the Washington National Cathedral and Muslim prayers were said, they invited me to, for example, do the first Jumwa in the cathedral. And that in itself was educational because we said to them, okay, where is a place in the cathedral where your iconography is not prominent? And so we found a place where there were no um, statues of Jesus or crosses or whatever the case may be. We looked at it and I said to them, oh, you have the arches, like I've seen them in Andalusia. And they have seven uh, indents and those are symbolic of the seven heavens. And that became something educational um, for, for, for the Washington National Cathedral. And then the Jumwa itself that we did um, mm -hmm. was, was, was absolutely crucial. And so it's really, um, we could have taken a hard line to say, no, there are crosses in here, we won't do it in your cathedral. But navigating it was more important than debating the issue of crosses in the vicinity. Um, and, 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 and it was really one of those things where sometimes soft power requires you to be soft as water in order for you to advance a cause that is, that is more important for, because the essence of coexistence is, as the Quran says, لِتَعَارَفُوا that you come to know one another and you can't know one another if you have too many preconditions. And so last one, for example, people expected that a Muslim ambassador would require people to take their shoes off mm. um, at the door. And I knew that that would be a barrier, but I designated the whole bottom part of the house as public space. There was no preconditions, no inhibitions in coming in. And sometimes we set up barriers by um, by putting up those kind of things. I think if we all take, for example, Hanafi Hudu, 
which doesn't break easily. It's more durable than Shafi would do. Um, and our women would, for example, shake hands. Um, it removes a barrier because otherwise we confirm stereotypes in the minds of people that we are over cloistering uh, women. Women are in the background. They've got no public role, etc. It may not be the case. The strongest woman um, may not shake hands, but that woman may be labeled as such. And so in a sense, I think we must understand where are those barriers and how can we relax those barriers without fundamentally compromising um, Islam and, and, and every opportunity for engagement we may have to take. Maybe a perfect middle, some would say. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. Um, so it's a quick pause on this side and uh, I will pass on to Farah in a second as well. Um, but I can see more and more people are joining slowly. Um, so those that are joining, um, you can get involved with the conversation. As always, we can keep it interactive. You can also ask a question. There are the uh, reactions button at the bottom that you can press or either raise your hand uh, and you can, we can bring you on. Or uh, alternatively, if you don't want to ask live questions, then the, the chat function is the best place to just post the questions and we can read it out on your behalf as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that covers that. Farah. That's very good, Nam. Um, really, really enjoying listening to you, um, Amas Abraham. Um, particularly, you know, being intolerant of intolerance, it's so important to have a voice and also express your opinions, but also in a way that um, embraces the dignity um, of Islam as well and the, the dignity of our values, which um, speaks on, leads on very nicely to my next question. So we, you spoke about our values speaking for us um, as opposed to our emotions and how can we do this on a community level to raise um, I guess the profile of Islam away from the negatives and more to the positive so I'd value your opinions and on that. I think the one thing about values is that Every community tries to make as if its values are unique to it. And so what you set up with such a discourse is a competition of values. Whereas if you go to the essence of a value, you may find that it is a human value. And so, for example, I, I refer to the Afghans, but in, for example, my interaction with the two sides in the Afghan conflict, the Afghanistan is in the Afghan conflict, we were able to show the correlation between the Maqasidu Sharia, the objectives and the values of Islam, and how they have touchstones in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the mediating teams themselves were surprised that they had seen Islam as bereft of values of rights, bereft of values relating to women and children. For them, we were just one mishmash of, of bad. But in unpacking that, they could see, but listen, we share these things. So the first thing about values is that there may be certain values, some values which may be exclusive, but there would be other values that are human. And the more we bring it to the level of human values, the more touchstones we find with ordinary other people. And so that's the, that's the first thing um, about values. The second one is on reaching with communities, we must often be careful about our passion. The question we must ask is, where is our passion coming from? Is the good place or a bad place? So sometimes you can have a Muslim saying all the right things in the most passionate ways, down with Zionism, for example. And the place could be justice or the place could be anger. And if it's justice, then you have the ability to, 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 to navigate a way in which to communicate with people so that they see the point of justice, 
They see your dignity. They see your reasonableness. They see how you are pointing out their injustice. Whereas if it were to come from a place of anger, they see your confusion between Zionism as an ideology and Judaism as a religion. Jews as fellow religionists and Jews as political perpetrators. You see, everything works on your ability to make distinctions all the time so that your intention, and that is why the fundamental principle in Islam is every action starts with an intention. If your intention is not purified, your communication will not be pure. You will then wonder why am I misunderstood because people are hearing your intention even though your words may be the same words that you use. And so it's this art of communication, this authentic narrative that is germane and integral to soft power has to start with a purified intention. You've got to struggle with yourself before you want to struggle with others. And that is why, for example, the story of Sayyidina Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, on the battlefield, about to kill his opponent in battle. The man spat in his face, after which, pondering, Sayyidina Ali withdraws his sword, and the man says, why did you do that? You're foolish. And Sayyidina Ali says, had I killed you before you spat in my face, it would have been for Allah. But after you spat in my face, it would have been because of my own sense of hurt. Now, if we, if Sayyidina Ali, in the heat of battle, can have that clarity of intention, why do we make the mistakes that we make in communicating who we are, what's upsetting us, how we are striving for justice, and what it is that we want to be able to achieve. So I want to, I can go into more detail. So for example, um, in South Africa, we earned the trust of our fellow Muslim, um, our fellow South Africans, because we understood that before the prophet on whom be peace, before he was Rasulullah, the messenger of God, he was Al-Amin, the trustworthy. We want to give a message, but not earn people's trust. And therefore, how we communicate, everything starts with trust building. If you are not trusted, you can come with the best of intentions, but you will always be mistrusted. And that is why our message will fall on barren soil, whereas trust fertilizes the soil on which our message and our actions come. That's a very nice way of saying it. The trust, you know, fertilise the soil of which our messages and actions come. And um, also, um, I really like, and it's something I believe strongly in, is that um, everything does work on your ability to make a distinction. Um, because at the end of the day, we're responsible for what we're saying and what we're doing and our intentions, whether in our daily life or whether in our Islamic life, are so vital to the results and outcomes that, you know, we'd like to have. I'm conscious of the time. I know we have five minutes um, until your adhan. And um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, so if you could briefly answer that as well. A theme that's been going on during um, our talks um, this Ramadan, particularly in the points of um, COVID as well, and the impact of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, it's caused us all to reflect on our actions and behaviours and values, as you, as you said yourself. So one um, fact that a lot of conversations happened around that we hope will change, certainly for post-COVID, is um, how do you make Islam one more accessible um, and to women as well? And um, how do you make it, how as Muslims can we live a life of sustainability? I'd be intrigued in the last three, four minutes or three minutes to hear from you regarding that. You know, Farah, COVID has been one of those iconic moments that we are living through. It has had the ability to turn from business as usual to business unusual. The world has 
never been so affected, every individual being affected. Climate change, we're affected by it, but it is not direct. You don't have to wear a mask for climate change. You don't have to social distance for climate change. And so along comes COVID to dramatize the crisis of the world. And I've used the term often, COVID-19 has been a moment of rupture. Moments of rupture can either be a descent into the abyss or it could be the prelude to rapture, something better and something joyful. And we've got to capture rapture out of rapture. And I think that this is a way in which our shared human fragility across the world can open up people's ability to regard us not as our stereotype, but as another fragile human being who come from fragile contexts like the war in Syria and the poverty in um, this and the genocide in, the, in, in, in Burma, et cetera, et cetera. So we have an opportunity to be human even before we are Muslim in the eyes of the world. And then they can see the Islam in us. I think COVID has the ability to remove the strongest tyrant like a Trump, to make vulnerable a populist like Modi, to shake up a Netanyahu, and to even make vulnerable a Bolsonaro. People who look very strong, suddenly they are feet of clay. And so in this gap in history, how do we insert ourselves? How do we insert who we are? Not just us, but the poor across the world. And, and most importantly, this moment shows not our vulnerability only, but our mutual dependence on each other. And therefore Muslims must be prepared to do what the Prophet Sallallahu endorsed, enter into Khilful Fudul, the coalitions of virtue. How do we make common cause with other people that we don't even know about across the world, global coalitions for virtue? How do we make sure that we do that? I think if we do that, we represent ourselves to the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You know, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you um, join us today. Before I hand over to Adnan for the final close, um, I'd just like to say, Salam Alaikum. Um, I'm going to be signing off now, so handing over to Adnan for this for our um, turkey leg. Um, so thank you, everyone who's joined us so far today. Thank you, um, Ambassador Ibrahim. It's been a pleasure. And Adnan, over to you for the close. Thank you, Farah. And uh, again, for myself as well, thank you very much, um, Ambassador Ibrahim, as well, for joining us for the talk today as well. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm sure I'm sure Farah and Iman have, have as well, as well as the audience at home. Um, so in the final close, we have a minute left. Um, just a final few words from myself as well. Um, the first and foremost uh, bit is to uh, thank all the people joining us today, everyone listening from home um, and joining in with conversations at home as well. Um, specifically, wanna, uh, we want to thank the Islam Channel, our media partners today for making this possible, um, and also the Arts Council UK as well. I know without their help, we can make this possible. Um, the Global Iftar Project definitely is something valuable and um, something specific that we're doing this year as well as last year so it's really good to see that it's running smoothly as well um as ramadan is a month of charity um we do encourage you to support ramadan Ten project by going online and uh, donating towards uh, the good cause on launchgood.com forward slash rtb 2021 i think we've got a couple seconds left um with the azan so i will pause here for a bit of reflection um I hope all the brothers and sisters in South Africa at the moment can enjoy their fast. Sounds good for me. اللهم إني لك صمت وبك آمنت وعلى رزقك أفطرت 
ذهب الظما وبتلت العروق وثبت الاجر ان شاء الله الله اكبر الله اكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول التامة والصلاة القائمة آت محمدا الوسيلة والفضيلة وابعثه مقاما محمودا الذي وعدته إنك لا تخلف الميعاد Okay, Islam from everyone. Um, it's now over here, over here again. So we're going on to the next leg of the Global Islam 2021 uh, into Turkey now in Istanbul. Right, so um, those that have joined us before this, we were in South Africa. Uh, we're going to move the conversation onwards now um, uh, whilst we go through the Global Islam, which is the world's largest um, virtual Islam taking place. Uh, we started in London. Um, and we followed across the globe to the United States, Australia, uh, India, I think might have skipped out this time, or we had Qatar, South Africa just before, and now we are in Turkey. Uh, and then we will go back to London a little bit later on today as well. Um, so thank you for joining us from, from Turkey at the moment and 
also, I suppose I can see some familiar faces from UK here as well. Um, I'm Adnan, I will be your host today. And uh, before we get into, into the details of the session today, um, I want to be able to thank our media partners. So we have two media partners today, Islam Channel um, and the UK Arts Council as well. I know without their work, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing at the moment, but also just all the support that we've been able to get from, from not only the global iftar, but also the virtual iftars we do um, every single year as well. You can support our cause uh, by going on launch good.com forward slash RTC2021 um, and we encourage us as well and there's lots of other more features and information about the work that, that's involved within the Ramadan Sync project. Okay so um, let's go through a little bit of housekeeping uh, with Zoom. So those I suppose most people might have used Zoom but those that haven't uh, it's it's very simple what we're going to do is basically have a reaction but at the moment uh, at the bottom that you can use to interact with us on on the screen so if you do click the reactions button uh you'll find a couple of options the specific one is raise hands you can use that just raise your hand ask any questions or sort of come live on the uh, on the screen you can also use other emojis as well such as clap thumbs up um and, and even a heart as well if you're, if you're feeling that so be simple to use um, there is a chats function, and the chats function we heavily encourage um, everyone involved to communicate with us, uh, raise any questions, have anything, uh, any comments, and share their thoughts on, on anything else they want to do as well through that feature. Uh, in the chat function, you can choose specifically who you want to message. So if there's a question that you don't want to post to everyone in the audience, then you can specifically put it to, to my name and I can raise that question for you as well. Right, I'm trying to think if I've forgotten anything. Um, and as always, we want this to be interactive. So um, everyone that's joining us, if you can open your cameras, this session is recorded, just bearing in mind. Um, but I think we want this to be as interactive as possible. Right, so without further ado, um, I'm just gonna have a conversation. We're, so we're, jo we're joined right now with Della Miles and the Adminti as well, um, and Shahib Webb as well. I wanna unmute all three. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me? You can see me? Loud yes, I can see you. I can hear you. <laughs> great, great. And uh, Riyadh as well, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. Can see awesome. you loud and clear. Fine. Um, and final, last but not least, Imam Shaheed, can you Absolutely. hear me and see me? Absolutely. Perfect. Well, is this going to be more of a conversation? Um, and we've got three amazing guest speakers, so I suppose it's going to flow like water. Um, just for your information and for everyone else um, watching at home as well, let me run through the quick agenda uh, so we're aligned to, to what, what we expect next. Um, so in the UK, I guess the UK times um, are a few hours behind uh, Turkey. However, we're going to have maybe a five minute introduction right now to everyone um, and just a bit of general conversation around what, you know, how Ramadan is going for yourself. Uh, and then after that, I think what we'll have is about a 20 to 25 minute session on, on each speaker um, about sort of yourself a bit more um, and your work that you're doing and also just general Ramadan reflections as well. So let's aim for about 5, uh, 5.30, let's say, so in about 10 minutes time. Um, after that, we have about 35 minutes overall of question and answers uh, and just generate any more questions. And then Yazan is going to go off at 6.06 which is the UK time, so three hours later would be in Turkey. Um, so that's the agenda. So we have about sort of 35, 40 minutes to basically get into the topic. Right. That being said, any questions at all so far? No? Perfect. Okay, so <laughs> Della's giving me a, a shaky yes or no. But... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm very new at this. I'm like a baby in Islam, so... I, I hope I can share something with someone. That's all I can say. Absolutely. No, well, uh, it, you're doing well, first and foremost, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, but since I've got you on camera first, why don't we start off with you? Um, a little bit of an introduction to yourself, a um, little bit of background um, for the audience and, and just for everyone else as guest speakers here as well. Okay, are we ready? We're ready. Okay, well, my name is Della Miles, and... Um, I'm from America, originally Houston, Texas, and uh, I'm an artist, a singer. 
I started my career in Los Angeles. Um, years after Whitney Houston became Whitney Houston, um, after the bodyguard, um, I was asked to work with her. So that is where my experience came from with her and with Michael Jackson. And after working with such artists, I decided, ah, I should try it on my own. And uh, it's been a true blessing for me. I've traveled the world and, um, and somehow I landed here in Turkey, which is amazing because this is where I was introduced to Islam. And I have to say before coming here, of course, I heard of Islam, but had no real knowledge or I have to say even no interest because there was no one around me, you know, who was practicing uh, any Islamic values. So I had no idea about the religion. And so it's a blessing that I came here and I, le I learned so much so far. Right. Well, well welcome to the show and uh, welcome to, I suppose, um, the new beginnings as well. So we'll come, Thank back. You. We'll come back for more shortly. Um, let me move to uh, Riyad Minty next for a brief introduction. I'm going to unmute. Oh, can you be on music? Welcome, right. right. Thanks for having me. So it's um, difficult to follow, um, Mr. Adela. Hi. Um, and even after Ambassador Rasul, I'm also South African. So it's, um, you know, in a blessed company and with Imam Sohabia, obviously. So it's an honor to be as a speaker with such esteemed people that's here. Um, so a bit about myself. I'm South African, um, born in South Africa. Um, I moved to Doha to join Al Jazeera, um, where I would join the new media team and kind of built a lot of the, was part of the team that built a lot of the digital strategy for Al Jazeera. I was there for a decade. Um, I spent some time in San Francisco, um, where I was the founder of AJ Plus, which I guess is a brand that a lot of people um, know and follow on digital platforms. And AJ Plus um, became one of the largest, probably the largest media brand on social platforms um, shortly after it launched. Um, and about five years ago, I took up the blessed opportunity to move to Istanbul. Um, I had a good offer from TRT, um, which is the public broadcast of Turkey, where we were building a new news network and decided to take the leap and try and help build something new that could be based out of Istanbul for the rest of the world. And I've been here for the last five years with uh, my wife, where I think, as Stella mentioned, I think Turkey or Istanbul is kind of a the country that calls you to it. I think it's um, almost, um, there's something special about this place that it's difficult to, to put into words, but it just feels like such a blessing to be able to, to be living here and spend the last five years here and just sort of engaging with um, the culture and the people. Okay, amazing. Um, actually, I've been to, a bit, uh, I'm gonna assume everyone is from Istanbul, but we'll, we'll come back down to Imam Shahib in a minute as well. Um, I have been to Istanbul once, and um, when I did in 2014, I think, at that point, I told my mom, like, mom, I'm ready to move here. This is this is the city I want to be in. Um, <laughs> primarily because I think it was, you know, it was in Asia and Europe, and it had the best of both worlds and the best of both weathers and, and basically everything and the culture as well. We'll come back to that in, in, in a second as well. Um, there, there is a lot of good stuff over here as well. I was doing a bit of profile reading on, on your side earlier. You might have seen me on LinkedIn as well. Um, and I'm definitely interested to hear more about the journey of sort of leading the social media on the Al Jazeera Plus side as well and what that really entailed. Um, building something on that on that granular level as well. Okay, so last but not least, Imam Shahab Webb, I'm going to unmute you and we'll have a quick introduction to yourself as well. I think you've been unmuted now. Assalamu um, alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Suhaib, actually, Suhaib Webb. Uh, Suhaib, actually, apologies. Uh, no, that's all right, it happens. Um, I'm actually from uh, Oklahoma City, so close to H Town, close to Houston. And I am a uh, professor, assistant adjunct professor at NYU uh, in New York City. Professor. And sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you say uh, the professor of? Of uh, Islamic studies, Islamic, Islamic studies. ethics and law. And, and is it correct that I read it earlier as well, um, you used to teach at uh, Boston, was it? I was an imam in Boston years ago. Sorry, apologies, you were an worked, imam. And, and wow. worked at Harvard, but. So it wasn't a professor. So, so you transitioned from Boston to New York. New York. That's, I mean, there's a big rivalry there. I don't know. I don't know if I'm right about this, but I've heard about 
sort of Boston, New York, which was a better one, but oh, we won't get into that. Kind of like, like, you know, Bradford fried chicken versus Manchester fried chicken, maybe. There's only one answer, really. <laughs> never, Brad, never Bradford, but <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that out. <laughs> great, great to have you on the show and great to, be, great to sort of um, get the introductions in as well. Um, yes, this is a open discussion, um, like I mentioned earlier as well, and I want to be able to sort of go through lots of different areas and different experiences everyone's uh, had so far. I'm keen to start sort of at the beginning um, and as Della Miles mentioned as well, in terms of coming to the journey of, um, of, of, of religion and Islam and, and what, what that was really like. And I suppose for my question, for, my, for myself, it's what, what was it? How did it happen? What enticed you or what sort of stood out to you that made you feel actually this is something I want to explore more? Are you speaking to Della? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, for me, um, religion is more than um, reading. It's more than putting the, the Bible or the Quran on the table so everyone can see it. It's more than praying five times a day. It's, it's, so for what brought me into it was the action of the people, the action of the people. And um, so for me, that was more important, the behavior and how it was shared to me and how I saw other people in Islam take off their sweaters and coats just to clothe someone. So these kind of actions and to feed the hungry, take someone to the grocery store and, full, and fill their refrigerator. These kind of things are the things that brought and caught my attention. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that goes for not only the Muslims right now as well, but for most of the people as well. The compassion you feel by those actions is definitely going to, you know, move, yes. move, yes. move any person. Um, yes. And, and was that in as you came to Turkey or was that sort of having... No, that before? was in Turkey. I, I experienced so many beautiful things in Turkey. As I said before, I didn't know anything about Islam before coming to Turkey. Yeah. And uh, and just from people that I know, their actions and their behavior is what caught my attention, and I wanted to know more. And and, and for the audience at home as well, I'm going to bring Riyad Minty into this as well, um, because you're also from uh, Istanbul. Um, can you describe what what is it like in Ramadan at the moment? What what, what are the sort of um, what are the streets like? Or maybe it might be might be due to COVID, it might not be the same as normal, but. What are these actions that you're talking about with people? What's the general atmosphere like? Um, we really want to know. Um, I mean, I can talk about Istanbul. We actually under lockdown at the moment. Okay. Um, so we just started a nationwide lockdown two days ago. It's a three week lockdown. So we are allowed to go out to buy groceries and bread and to the nearest masjid for your five salas or um, any prayer place, but there's no Tarawi prayers. So it's quite, um, it's a very different atmosphere. Um, the masjids do thicker on Friday nights from the loudspeakers and on Thursday nights, which is absolutely beautiful to, to be able to hear. Um, but we are really missing that normal Ramadan spirit. So I've been here for five years and sort of the pre-COVID Ramadan um, atmosphere is um, absolutely magical where it's, you know, you go in out for your tarawis, obviously it's long days, but People are having picnics for iftar out in the parks in front of the masjids. It's a very uh, family-oriented space. Um, but this Ramadan, like last Ramadan, it's a lot more um, reflective. People are at homes and sort of your own family units and having a Ramadan. So I do know that a lot of people and a lot of my colleagues, uh, you know, last Ramadan was a struggle, this Ramadan too, because a lot of people are locked up um, at home. And normally Ramadan is a time where people can go out and share and engage in spaces. So it's also important to kind of remember that. And I think if people have friends who are alone at home and under lockdown anywhere in the world, so maybe just give them a call or, you know, and just check in on them because Ramadan can be quite um, lonely and isolating for a lot of people when you don't have that collaborative spirit that we may normally be used to. Yeah, and that's a really good point you raised actually about being able to just drop in, drop in on anyone, drop in your friends, your family, just check in it. It doesn't take long for, for anyone to sort of do that as well. Um, Ella Miles, how about yourself? Well, I am actually in, um, are you speaking to me? Yeah, I'm not sure. It, 
Can you can you hear me uh, clearly? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm in Dalian, and um, so I live in a village, and I live. Uh, in a huge garden when I have lots of chicks and ducks and animals around me. So, and mountains and the lake. And so it's quite refreshing. If you have to be on lockdown, I, I feel extremely blessed that, you know, that I am surrounded by the mountains and the water. And it's kind of like a, it's comforting for me. So, because I am alone here. So it is comforting for me. You've, you've got to join us more and more on um, more virtual open iftars as well, because the essence of the virtual open iftar um, is, is is exactly that, to be able to bring people together from all from all areas of life as well. Um, I just wanted to share a quick experience as well that, you know, in 2019 was when I first went to the Ramadan tent project, the actual tent that takes place in London. Um, and it's an exceptional experience for anyone from all walks of life to be able to share not only just food, but I think, you know, come together um, and share experiences. So I went to this, I loved it, enjoyed it, saw the whole vibe. And I thought, actually, I want to get involved and actually be part of this um, experience too. So COVID did happen a year after. However, putting something virtual together and being able to bring people together in this, in this moment um, of, of isolation uh, is, is, is very, very important, I think. And I think it seems to be working relatively well, if not, you know, using technology can definitely help. Um, and we'll come, come to this talk about sort of technology in a minute as well. Um, I want to turn my attention a little bit to uh, Imam as well and, and ask him sort of his experience so far. Um, am I correct to assume that you're based in New York right now as well as, as seen as you're, being, uh, you're teaching there? I'm currently in Washington, D.C., but still based in New York. Okay, <laughs> so the West Coast. And um, I can't hear yourself too clearly. Is it better now? Much better. Much better. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and can you tell us a bit more about the experience in Washington so far as well in terms of Ramadan and um, a bit more about sort of, you know, what's really going on as well so we can get the I mean, of course, I mean, last year was somewhat traumatic, especially for those of us. I live in Brooklyn, uh, New York City. Um, and my wife and I actually became very ill. Um, early on in March before anyone really knew, you know, what was going on. And then we started seeing, you know, bodies in parks uh, in morgues, you know, makeshift morgues and triad hospitals in like in, in Central Park. Um, so I think there's still and, and the Muslim community, especially in New York City, was hit um, perhaps more so than others because Muslims, we tend to live in large families. And so you have relatives and people couldn't just suddenly stop working. Yeah. Um, and then now in DC, you know, there's still trepidation, right? There's still some fear of people losing, especially a lot of us, like I have older family members in my home. Um, so young folks may be not worried about getting sick. So coming into Ramadan this year was a lot of worry, but now mas masajid have started to open, alhamdulillah. And people are going back um, to Masajid for Tarawih. And you feel like, you know, people are um, just happy, right? There's a sense of, you, you know, you don't, you don't realize what you love until it's gone. It's yeah. a great adage, right? And the Prophet said, that a person that will be under the shade of Allah is a person whose heart is attached to the Masjid. So I think for a lot of us, it's just like, wow, finally, you know, back in the masajid around the community having iftars um and of course the turkish center is down the street the huge turkish mosque ran by the turkish government um they have iftars every night in pg county so it's nice man it's good it's good to be back um i'm glad i'm glad to hear that as well and um the situation in the uk is uh definitely better from where it was before in the sense that now in, in my local mosque in reading we have socially distanced uh, uh, spots basically in the, in the mosque. And we're lucky because we've got a big space. So, you know, you can have the two meter distance between one another. You bring, you bring your own prayer mat, you have to wear a mask uh, and you bring a bag to keep your shoes with you as well. So just eliminate all those, uh, the, the, the main points of, of contact with people. And I think already, like you said, um, compared to what it was last year when there was no Tarawi, there was, there was no interactions at all allowed. You can't even leave your house to where we are now. 
Um, yeah. it, it's a really good reflective period of how far everyone has come, uh, not just for, for sort of Muslims, but just also, you know, humanity as well. Um, so um, let's take this towards the technology side of things because I'm quite keen to understand a bit more as well. And let me unmute um, Ria. And, and I wanted to sort of talk more about sort of, you know, your work that you've done, not only sort of AJ Plus, but also in, in the sense that the importance of technology in all of this as well, and a bit of reflection of, you know, where we were before to where we've come to now as well, um, embedded by sort of technology such as Zoom, but, but everything else. Uh, um, so before I talk about it, I could just maybe touch on something that you said about, you know, how far we've come in terms of from last year. I think the fact that you in the UK and Imam Saib in the US are feeling that way, but people in the rest of the world are feeling different, also shows the disparity in terms of access for the majority of the world when it comes to vaccines. And I think the vaccines have enabled a lot of that for people in the West uh, living in Western countries versus the rest of the world who are still trying to get enough access to be able to get vaccinated. And I think it's also important to remember that um, while things are opening up for some parts of the world, um, majority of the world just don't have access to vaccines while some countries are hoarding vaccines, for example. Um, and you look what's happening in India and elsewhere, it's just, um, there's a lot more that's going on. And I think maybe just to also locate ourselves back into that, the greater awareness and for those who are able to get back into the masjids to still be able to pray and remember to make prayers for those around the world who are still under lockdown in different spaces um, in that way. Um, so just to come back to answer your question, um, um, obviously technology has changed a lot. And I think um, COVID has, I think, fast-tracked a lot of the adoption of digital platforms and digital technology where previously it was still, you know, you had people who would be a bit more resistant in, you know, can we work from home, for example, just the ability to work from home. Um, most companies were very hesitant to do that. And I think, you know, the last year has shown that it's completely feasible to work from home. And it seems like most companies are trying to adapt to a hybrid model where in whatever we call the new normal with you know, a few people, a few days in the office, a few days working at home and being more flexible in terms of how we can adapt to this new world that we're gonna be in. Um, and technology, it's, you know, it, I work in technology, I work in media and I have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, so as much as I love technology and the ability for us to be able to connect around the world and to be able to, um, you know, tell stories and, you know, get into different spaces, um, we're also in the age where there's so much information that's being shared and sometimes it adds a lot of noise to our life. And I think for myself personally, and it's sort of a personal reflection, I try to take a lot of time outside of my workspace to actually try to disconnect or, you know, get out of those um, thousands of WhatsApp groups that are there to try and curate my digital life to see how I can actually engage with spaces that I'm able to benefit from um, and mutually uh, beneficial in that space. And I think that the challenge we have now um, is there's just so much availability. So even as we have in the session on, you know, the Ramadan Din project, there are three or four other talks taking place and Zoom right now and people just have to, you know, what can I go to? And we're trying to grab it all the different sort of spaces. Um, and I think once in a while, it might be good for us just to kind of put the brakes on and maybe just catch our breath. And I think also just to reflect and, you know, we don't always have to be in a rush to always be connected and be hyper-connected all the time, that we can take a step out of that and just kind of recalibrate a bit internally. And for me, Ramadan is a good month to be able to do that, just to be able to take that step back and reflect a bit more um, where we are. And as we move forward, um, you know, into this new normal, obviously everything will be a lot more connected. Um, just important to remember that, you know, yes, technology is there and it's our friend and it makes the world, um, can make the world a better place, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword and we need to play our parts in this sort of digital world of how we can add value to society and use these platforms to, you know, drive conversations forward, not just creating awareness about problems that are out there. And I mean, one thing I'm very passionate about is not using these platforms to be reactive to the news, but to be proactive. How can we tell our stories in a positive way? How can we showcase the beauty of Islam and our religion in a positive way on the digital platforms? Um, that's something that I think um, sitting for me, at least in terms of my reflections for the last year and how technologies can facilitate that. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. There, there, there's, there's a lot happening um, around this now as well. And it might be off topic, but I mean, even, even sort of sports and, and sports clubs are looking at social media and the effects of it, the negative effects of it in terms of racism and boycotting and that, and that sort of stuff as well. Um, because it, it's more and more integrated within our lives now to be able to think about, well, okay, technology is here to stay. And therefore, you know, how can we best leverage this um, uh, not only just to elevate ourselves and our daily lives, but also, you know, reducing noise coming down um, from it as well. Just to add, I mean, 
I've sort of tried to do a, in terms of fasting Ramadan, yes, you, you know, you typically don't eat, but social fast is something I'm looking at right now as well. How can I ensure that I am stopping myself slowly to get off social media a little bit and actually have a bit more headspace, I suppose, and, um, and, and I guess feel better. So um, let's come back to that in a bit more uh, detail as well. There is, there is more questions coming in. So um, actually, let's go to the question right now. I'm going to bring in Hawazin, who has a question. Sorry, Hawazin, to put you on the spot. Assalamu alaikum. No problem at all. Thank you very much, all uh, our speakers for coming, for joining us from all over the place. Barakalafikum, thank you so much. Uh, so my question is, um, do you think things actually, uh, speaking about the representation of Muslims in the media, do you think compared to what was done before, uh, do we have like a kind of small progression on the, on this level or do you think we still need to do effort we still need to invest on the representation of muslims in the media and how we want to um master it when we don't want someone else to tell us like this is how you are actually and we are not like this so what, what do you think uh, about that uh Riyad, or even to uh, the imam let's let, let's go to um imam suhaib first don't you think we should go to the media expert? I mean, he's uh, I'm, I'm his specialty to is media. A bit. He's the founder <laughs> of. Uh, I mean, I'm not. My specialty is Sharia and Qiraat, so I, okay. I would certainly defer to. So in that case, let's go to Riyadh. I mean, I can counter that, uh, Imam Sayyid, to say that you're probably the one Imam with sort of the best engagement in social media and the way you approached it over the last few years. Um, and it's something I think that's a real good example in terms of representation and how to use these platforms to, to have a voice that's out there um, in a way. Um, to, to answer the question, I think there's a lot of work we still need to do in terms of representation. We're very far away from that. And I think, um, you know, at TRT, we produced a show called Edge to Rule. I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Some of you might have heard of it. Um, it's been watched the last 12 months by about 5 billion people on YouTube or 5 billion views on YouTube. So it's um, gone incredibly viral. But the one thing that we've seen from that is that it's sort of the first show that shows um, heroes that are rooted in faith um, so that they don't shy away from being Muslim. They're your heroes are getting there. Um, you know, Ejru gets his advice from Ibn Arabi, for example, that comes to him and there's the hadith and they go and pray their salah and the prayers that go there. So they're not trying to change their identity to mold within a specific norm that we see in other shows. Um, you know, there's a thing that I just saw yesterday, which was really disappointing. Um, it's a new Netflix show. And I think the scene was the, the lady was breaking her fast with a tequila shot and said, Bismillah, I'm taking a tequila shot. Um, and, you know, those sort of things that representation just for the sake of representation doesn't work. And what we've seen a lot of the time with a lot of sort of the Hollywood productions that are trying to be more inclusive with representation, there's no space for people who are or would be termed conservative in a way. There's a liberalized version of the faith that may exist within the space, and maybe that's there. Um, but for people who are not in that space and are still, you know, adhere to the, the tendency of Islam, there's a very big lack of representation in that space. And for me, that's the biggest challenge to get into. And, you know, a show like Rami did amazing in terms of, you know, breaking down barriers in terms of getting into that space. But again, it is very much within a specific space. And there's this whole other part of the Muslim world that does exist that's still not yet represented and it's still seen as taboo in a way if you go and pray your salah at work or if you take your, um, you know, if you go to your bottle to go take your stinja, it's still sort of the, the jokes that people have in the space that it comes in in those sort of spe uh, specific ways. So I think there's a lot more that we need to be able to do in how we actually take representation that can be authentic, um, that can be representative of people who are and adhere to our, our faith in, this, um, you know, in all its standards that may be there. Um, and I mean, the challenge we have is it goes all the way from script writers. Everyone these days who I talk about wants to get into media, everyone wants to get into news. How can we be a journalist? How can we get into the space? And that's within the Muslim space. I think a lot of that is also being um, reactive to the news that's out there, um, where we see Islamophobia happening in France and we want to be engaged in that story and we want to always get stuck into that. But we're not taking a step back and saying, how can we actually address the, you know, the stereotypes that have been existing within Hollywood, within other spaces, and how can we create media that's not just for Muslims. And I think Edgar Rules has shown that we've seen that non-Muslims around the world have watched it and have been able to connect to it because the messaging and the values are universal and the, universal as it comes to love, as it comes to justice, as it comes to equality within the space. 
So these are themes I think that we could uh, weave into spaces and narratives that I think critically important. And I mean, to anyone watching this, I would really encourage people to get in, you know, go out and become script writers, then to become producers, then to become filmmakers, because this is a need that exists right now. Um, and there is a demand and an audience that's there to watch it and needs to be served for sure. Um, but we just don't have enough people coming through at this point to be able to serve that need. Wow. Um, I mean, I feel as Zine says, maybe being a bit more unapologetic um, in, in this case as well. Um, and I think even, even hearing what Della has to say, we have the famous Della Miles here, right? So <laughs> as a woman and as a black woman in America and now as a Muslim woman, I'm yeah. sure she can talk a lot about how you don't lose yourself to trying to make, especially the entertainment business, happy, right? And that's, that's something that I worry about. Muslims are worried about constantly how to, how, how to get along with others, with yeah. others who aren't worried about getting along with us, right? And, and I mean, I understand the need to negotiate the earth, but not at the expense of the heavens. And that's what I love about what Riyadh said, right? Like, okay, we can tell women not to shake people to shake people's hands, but there's a clear hadith that says don't, mm. right? And I was listening to Ambassador Russell's talk, and I appreciate him, but at the same time, where do we draw a line on this is haram, right? And this is who we are, and let the light of the obedience of Allah shine into people's lives. And I would love to hear from Della as as a, as a woman, a black woman from Houston who <laughs> negotiated and navigated the entertainment industry before Me Too existed, right? Before people were woke and maintained her dignity. That's one of the things I've always loved about you, Della. You know, I'm a, I'm a silent fan, is <laughs> her ability to maintain her integrity, right? Yeah, no yeah. sellout, as Chuck D used to say, no sellout. So I, I do worry that, and I appreciate what Riyadh said, like with Rami, there are things, Rami has a sexual relationship with a woman he meets at a mosque. The neoliberal agenda to create a culture of heathenry. And I'm not, I, I voted, I vote progressive left, but my concern is that there is an attempt to amplify the voice of heathenry among a woman having her iftar with tequila. I mean, this is kufr, it's disbelief. Right. I mean, that, that's, that's clear disbelief. So I would want to hear from from Della on how do we not sell it also to people who like us or act like they like us? Well, you, yes. You know what? I have to say that in, in my life, because my mother was a very strong Christian and my mother and, and my mother instilled so many principles in her six children. And one thing she taught us was to stay in your lane. And you don't have to do as the Joneses do. If you believe something, whatever it is, stay in your lane. Don't let someone stop you from where you are going and what you are heading towards. And I have taken this with me even through my career. When I was working with Whitney Houston, and you can imagine some of the things that I've seen and some of the things that's been offered to me and some of the parties and, and all these things. But I, I tell you, I raised my right hand to Allah. I did my job. And after the concert, I went to my hotel room by myself. I did, because my mom taught me if you're not there and something happens, no one can say Della was there. Stay in your lane. <laughs> if you're not there, you're not there. And I made that a routine. So it, eventually after so many years, everybody would say, oh, well, you know, Della not coming because that was my routine. They knew my focus was not to party, not to drink, not to do drugs. So they even stopped offering it to me because my light was different. And so, that's, that's all I can say. I thank my mother for these principles because she taught me to stay in my lane. And, and can I add one more thing? Sorry. Yes. Uh, and I really, because Riyad, Riyad really got me motivated. It's Riyad's fault. Um, <laughs> but Jay-Z has, Jay -Z has a great line where he says, either you own or being owned. And, and that's one of the things I appreciate about, about AJ Plus 
you know, I was in the Bay Area. I don't know if I was there when you were there. It's just the independence of the voice. And that it, yeah. and, and again, we are surrounded by conservatives who want to physically destroy us and liberals mm -hmm. who want to spiritually and dogmatically destroy us. I mean, we're in a very difficult position in the world. So that's why it's important to fund the efforts of independent voices in our community, artists, filmmakers, people that are yeah. in media, because you know that that is really the voice of our community, are, are these yeah. people. So being yeah. owned or owning, I think, is something to think about as well. A really good hmm. point. Yes. And um, I, I mean, I want to ask, I want to ask more about this, um, Delamars, as well, more about you know, staying true to who you are, and and you know, having having your mother as well to be able to tell you, you know, stay in your lane, for example, and and, and stay true to who you are. If if for example, someone is also entering this industry, and you know, they're going to be subject to all of these issues, and 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 uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? But influence, I suppose. H how can they stay true to who they are without having, you know, someone supportive at the top or or someone around them as well? How can they really just hold that tight to them? And, and sort of... There's no easy answer to this question. Mm -hmm. It's it's really going to be mm -hmm. a personal choice, and how strong is the foundation of that artist? And I always say to young artists, know who you are before you start. Mm -hmm. If you believe in who you are and you believe in your talent and what you have to offer, you will never have to sacrifice yourself. And mm -hmm. if that one door closes, believe me, another one will open because of who you are. But if you sacrifice and yeah. you give in to anything that they're offering you, that door still will close with you in it. Wow. <laughs> That's, that's pretty profound, actually. And the reason why I ask is because that could be the reason why people don't go into media, for example. You know, that could be the reason why we're not seeing enough uh, development in that area. And and so there needs to be some sort of influence to be able to say, well, actually, look, like we can create an avenue for, for people that have the boundaries in place as well to say it's a safe area, it's a safe place to be able to go and join media, for example, as well, um, which actually takes me to uh, uh, something you're doing at the moment as well. I believe it's the Della Kids Club. <laughs> you know, that came to me um, during the first lockdown. I was in Dubai with my son and uh, my son goes to school there. And so I actually went to get him to bring him to Turkey because they started online schooling. And so soon as I landed, all the borders closed. So I ended up staying in Dubai um, for two to three months. And I just, I was going crazy. I was like, what am I gonna do, you know? And so my son and I decided, let's teach the kids, let's teach English. Let's give them something. You have time, let's do it. And so that's where the kids club came from. And, and how's that going so far as well? I mean, uh, what's, what, you've, what have you seen through the development of, of teaching online? Um, well, you know, you mentioned about having that influence and having that, you know, positive mindset. Um, I, I received yeah. a lot of positive feedbacks and the best feedback you can ever get is from a child. And when they write me and they send me videos with them singing along with the, the YouTube video channel, it is just the most rewarding. I mean, my heart is just flowing with <laughs> gratitude, really. That's really, really cool to hear. Um, I want to be able to see some of this uh, some work as well, but I think the influence and in sort of, you know, pushing, motivating um, and adding knowledge and value to not only kids, but also, you know, everyone else during this Ramadan is quite, quite important from many angles. Um, and, and that sort of is another question that's come in um, around we're in the last 10 days of Ramadan now, and it's the most important uh, section. The whole thing's important, but the, people tend to focus on the last 10 days. And so, um, starting with with Imam Suhaib, um, the last 10 days, how do we make the most of it? It's a big Great question. question. <laughs> yeah, there's there's really a, yeah, it's like you're hitting us with a lot of different uh, serious, serious inquiries here. Um, <laughs> So actually, there's there's three things that really the scholarly tradition um, gives us to think about in the last 10 days. Number one is we should be extra studious in observing the obligations. Mm -hmm. 
right? So we should look to what triggers. So in the last 10 days, not only do we want to just simply perform the obligations, we want to start creating triggers that allow us, once we're out of Ramadan, to continue those obligations, right? So what triggers, what triggers good? Not just the good. How can I furnish my heart in a way that good becomes easy? The second thing is we want to do the opposite with evil. So luckily we're fasting. And in some ways, this is one of the few benefits of COVID-19 is, you know, that we are now able to distance ourselves from certain types of evil that are really like societal evil, right? You can only do it in a group of people. You know, even Hajar, uh, the great, great ninth century scholar, he lost three daughters to the bubonic plague. And he, he actually wrote a book about plagues. And he says one of the virtues of all this was like, I'd stay at the house. You know, I, I couldn't go out. I, you know, I had no choice but to be good, right? So now putting in triggers that distance me from evil. And then the third is what's called that we start to restrict ourselves even in the areas of the permissible. So, you know, Imam Shafi has a great statement. He says, you'll never truly become righteous until not only do you distance yourself from the forbidden, but also from certain components of the permissible, fearing that you may fall into the forbidden. So like the last 10 days, we want to think about that as an attitude. And then, of course, increasing our prayers and our duas, our supplications. You know, these are the last 10 nights. We know that in one of these blessed nights is the Laylatul Tuqadr, you know. So we just want to make sure we worship a little every night, right? So that we guarantee, hopefully, that we catch it. Mm. And then, of course, the altruistic component, the Prophet became much more generous um, with his time and with his wealth uh, in these last 10 days. Right. Um, and, and it's an open question as well to, to Della Miles and Riyad Minty as well. Any thoughts from, on your, from your side? I mean, for me, um, because this has, <laughs> as I've, I've, even with COVID, you know, I've said this has been as sad as it is, it's in my life, it's been also very positive because I've got a chance to reflect on a lot of things about my family, about my son, you know, and, and especially during Ramadan, being here alone, um, it's just a lot of reflection going on with me and a lot of questions. And, and actually I would love to be in contact, oh, forgive me for not, being able to say your name, but my, my brother from New York, because I, I have so many questions and about Islam. And absolutely. so this time for me has just been a reflective time. And I've been trying to read, but as you know, it's, some of it is very difficult to understand. And, um, mm -hmm. but it's also very calming to be in the nature and to see God's work again. I mean, he's an artist. When you when you see the mountains and the lakes, and you just go, Allah. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. So Sorry. it's another reflection of his work. And so I'm just, I'm just happy. That's all. I'm just happy. And I hope in the next 10 days, everything will come to an end. But at the end, it will be a new start for me. That's that's my that's my idea. And uh, Imam Sahib, would you, I suppose the, the, the request was more for information there as well. I mean, you can separately probably um, run that cost as well, but also if anyone else is interested or, or any good links or books to read or um, any recommendations, I think would, would definitely be valuable for, for our readers and, and listeners here as well. And for myself, certainly as well. Um, Riyadh, would, is there anything else you would like to add? I can't add anything on top of what is really said. It's just really beautiful. Um, I think, yeah, it's just, um, I think just being able to pause and reflect and appreciate the beauty around us. So I think, you know, if you're able to do that, I think that's, that's what it is, right? And find the creator in the creation around us. So if you're able to find that, inshallah, I think we're in a good space. Inshallah, inshallah. Um, so I'm just going to quickly check how we're doing for time. So we, we have about, I say about five more minutes uh, before we might have to conclude. Um, and um, I think for the last five minutes, Imam, if you're happy to give a dua for, for us to then go into Azan, um, I think that would be quite a good way to sort of go into the end. 
Um, but before that, um, I'm quite in, keen to hear about sort of, let, let's talk about the reflections of Ramadan a little bit more as well. Um, and what you've sort of felt like you've gained from this Ramadan itself. Who wants to, who would like to go sort of first? If... Well, I, I can go because um, uh, my husband is actually in the hospital. And, um, but the doctors are saying that by the end of Ramadan, inshallah, he will be home. But he was home, he was in the hospital from COVID. Okay. And um, so being here alone with, uh, without him, um, it's been very traumatic for me. And it's, again, I can say to reflect on his life and my life and my son's life. And even in the midst of that, to see the goodness in all of this. And so still it's a grateful time for me. And I'm, I'm very grateful just to be here and to have this time to reflect. Beautiful, thank you. And uh, and beyond. I think for me, I am, it's been a good time to pause also and just take a step back from things and think about what's really important in life. You know, a lot of the time we spend time chasing work and full of time with a lot of different spaces. But I think with COVID, it's just been a time to really prioritize a lot of things in my own life personally and kind of reconnect with things that really matter to me and to reconnect with myself in a way because um, the type of work that I do with media, it's you always dealing and engaging with a lot of space, um, a lot of impact and a lot of voices from around the world coming to you and asking questions. And it's easy to get lost in those conversations and lose yourself in sort of these bigger conversations that people want to have. And I think this time for me, it's just been really good to take that pause, come back and reconnect with myself, my wife, my family. Um, it's also the longest period in my life that I've not been able to see my parents. Um, I haven't been able to travel home to South Africa to see them. Normally I would see them at least even though I live abroad, try to see them twice a year, but not being able to see them. It's, you know, it, it takes a lot of talk when you speak to your mother and she's like, is this, am I ever gonna see you again or not? Um, and that's also a privilege to be able to have that conversation with your mother because there's so many people who aren't able to travel or have that luxury to be able to go mm -hmm. and jump on a flight whenever they want to go. So it's always this, you know, you feel the sadness in some spaces, but there's always a um, you know connection back to realize that that sadness is coming from a place of such privilege compared to what's really happening in the world for so many people that's out there. Um, which you're able then to turn that into thankfulness um, and just kind of presence yourself in that moment to be truly grateful for everything that we have um, in our lives. So I think that's really been um, the strong and maybe this last 12 months for me. I think I think I'm very similar in that respect as well. Where it wasn't until I sort of went away to Egypt and saw the culture over there a little bit more. Um, just, just before the lockdown sort of happened, I sort of got an experience out in Egypt to see really what is Ramadan like over there, how do people interact, what is the essence of um, brotherhood and connectivity there as well. It's, it's a completely different feel from London from, from my perspective. Um, and when you get that and you get that glimpse, you realise, you know, actually there's, there's a lot of things to be grateful for, for sure. There's so many things that you can take for granted quite easily in, in, in London, for example, living here. But at the same time, there's so much more to strive to uh, as well. Um, and, and just a final question, I think, before we go into um, Imam's uh, dua towards the end as well. But what are you hopeful for for the next sort of year going forward as well? And, and anything sort of like, we want to leave on a light, optimistic note. And I think that'd be quite nice to hear um, your thoughts on that as well. So I'll come to uh, Delilah first and then Riyadh. And then what we do is we'll go into uh, sort of final reflections from Imam Suhaib um, and also the wife can conclude as well. Okay, so Delilah first, please. Yes, um, I think it's, it's quite simple. I, I hope for peace. I hope that the world can get through this pandemic and that, as you say, we can see our families again and and see even more of our friends and, and all the good in people that we took for granted. We have taken each other for granted so often and now we don't see each other. And so my hope is that we can all come together again in, in a peaceful way. And that means politicians and everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Delilah. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you. Um, I hope that we learn something from this. I think that it's sometimes when we get back to normal, it's easy just to get back to a normal life as things were before. 
Um, but the world has changed and I think we've seen so many things and so many different phases of it that we've gone through in this last year. And I hope that we're able to take the lessons from this, really fully embrace it and build a better world. Um, I think there's so much that we can learn from this of how we should be in terms of giving, in terms of reactiveness, in terms of supporting our communities in times of crisis. And I hope that, inshallah, that we're able to take those lessons and you know, really manifest it in our own lives, starting with ourselves first, with our families, with our communities, with the broader society in that space. But let's hope that we're able to learn. That's a comment from, from uh, Hawazina as well, spending more time with the family. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's all the same thing for all of us here as well. So um, just quickly, we have a couple of minutes left and uh, we will go into a bit of a final reflection and also a uh, dua from Imam Mr. Um Before I do that as well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you, Delilah Miles, and also Riyadh Mr. Pinty as well. Please do join us again. Um, I hope that we can do this uh, uh, next year, inshallah. Hopefully it's live. And, um, and we would love to have you uh, as guest speakers at the event also as well. And I'd love to be there as well to, to see this. Um, we'll go into the final reflections within Imam Sahib now. Jazakumullah uh, khair. First of all, tashakur uh, them to everybody, alhamdulillah. Um, uh, and, and Riyadh, it's always nice and invigorating to hear you and, you know, see, see how things... Oh, actually, I was wanting to hear how you struggle to like maintain covering Muslims in Ramadan in an authentic way, because that's obviously a battle for us, at least here in the U S and then, uh, Della is, um, you know, just invigorating, uh, powerful story. And Adnan, thank you for being, uh, it's never easy being a moderator, especially when the camera's on your face, it's even more <laughs> difficult. And for all of the people who attended here at the RTP, it's an incredible project, incredible effort to bring people together. As the Prophet said, Il feed people, right? It's one of his most important statements that Islam is to feed people. So personally, I just think that Ramadan is a reminder of our own mortality. Uh, you know, we start after Fajr very strong. And by, you know, midday, you start to feel like what it's like to hit your 40s. And then after Asr, you know, that's what it's like to start, you know, being ready for Medicare. And then you break your fast and that reminds you of Jannah. So every day, actually, of Ramadan is a encapsulation of our life cycle. And it centers us on our own mortality. And it reminds us that, you know, what am I living for? And, and I don't necessarily have to live for consumption, right? By reducing consumption, I actually find the energy to live and pay attention to greater things. I see things I didn't see before because my stomach isn't clouding my vision. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, by all of his names and attributes to bless the great work um, that Ramadan, Ramadan Tim Project is doing and continues to do. Uh, we pray for uh, Della's husband. My wife also had COVID, so I've been in this position before. Um, we ask Allah to cure him, uh, to make his sickness a means of his forgiveness, um, and to bring him home uh, to you as the best Eid gift that anyone could have to be, <laughs> be with, their, with their spouse. And we pray for Yad, who our media brothers and sisters are really under tremendous pressure, um, whether it's from the Zionists, whether it is from the neocons, whether, again, from the neoliberal agenda, maintaining a true authentic voice within media is really, it's about not having a job, honestly, right? If you really want to maintain certain positions and you become you know, an independent journalist. So Riyadh, we ask Allah to bless you, to strengthen you, um, to continue this great work. Uh, Adnan, may Allah SWT raise you, you know, bless your family. Uh, this consistency of being able to pull off this project is a gift uh, from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and yataqabal minna siyamana wa qiyamana wa yuzakki anfusana wa yuthabit aqdamana wa yansurna ala a'dainna ويثبت الإيمان في قلوبنا وكرمنا بتقوى والحلم وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسلم كثيرا آمين Thank you, thank you not only to yourself Imam Sahib but also um, all the guest speakers that have joined us today but Della Miles, Riyad Minzi it's been an absolute pleasure from my side and from our own Project as well 
final the final thanks I want to be able to give as well is everyone that's joined us on, on our social media today, um, everyone that's behind the scenes that we don't get to see, um, uh, that has put a lot of work over here as well. And also our media partners, um, Islam Channel and Art Council UK, um, without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this as well. We are, I think, now just about to go into the Azan. So I'm going to quickly pause over here for a quick reflection period whilst we play the Azan in, in a couple of seconds. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Yeah, إني لك صمت وبك آمنت وعلى رزقك أفطرت وبتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول
اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة والصلاة القائمة